ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Could I have your attention, please, for a second? We are going to start, and we have to start promptly because we have a live feed uh, to Manchester. So if I could ask you all to take your seats, please, and then we'll begin. Thank you. Good evening and a very big welcome to the Open Future Festival. My name is Dominic Ziegler. I'm the economist, a Banyan columnist, writing about all things Asian. Open Future is our initiative to make the case for freedoms, rights, and open societies, which are values that have all come under attack. It's also an initiative that brings in outside and diverse uh, voices to discuss issues such as free societies, free markets, technology, uh, <coughs> immigration. At The Economist, we also think that it upholds core values. Hong Kong talks about Hong Kong core values. We have our values too. And simply, they are a belief in progress, even if it's sometimes halting. Uh, a strong belief in constitutional government that is constrained and monitored by robust institutions and a free press, and a belief also in cast iron guarantees for the rights of all individuals. That's the liberalism that The Economist espouses. Now, this event is actually a global one. It's going to chase the sun. It starts here in Hong Kong. We have a live link to Manchester, and then the conversation goes on to an event in Chicago. Now, all three cities uh, tell a story. Their lives is the story of free enterprise. And in the case of Manchester, it's also a home to the kind of liberalism that has underpinned the economist's principles for 176 years. Now, Hong Kong, for possibly too long, was uh, seen as primarily or even only an economic city. Um, there was, for too long, I think, a sense that uh, Hong Kong was too busy making money to, to worry its head uh, about politics. But 
in recent months, it's become clear that actually for some time, uh, many people in Hong Kong, a large segment of society, believes that the system is rigged against them by self-serving elites. Now that's something that a lot of the world is feeling. It's a sentiment that is abroad in Europe uh, and America and elsewhere. And in some places, certainly the US, um, it's been the occasion for that sentiment to be hijacked by demagogues um, who use it for their own purposes uh, and claiming to speak for the people. Now we're going to be discussing this theme all the way around the world today. It's relevant here, of course. There's another big theme which is also relevant, and that is China. Now China aspires to global leadership, not through open societies and limited government, but through state-directed economic and political power exercised by the monopoly of the Chinese Communist Party. So it's those two themes that underpin the uh, extraordinary protest movement against the government over the past few months and the increasing turmoil and, um, and instances of, of violence. We're going to be discussing uh, that uh, today, of course, in more than one session this evening. Um, but uh, what I would like to do uh, now is, is, uh, is just to explain the something of the format here. Um, one of the consequences uh, of the uh, unrest here is, it, is that it's had a practical impact on this evening. Unlike in Manchester and Chicago, uh, we haven't been able to open the doors to all comers. So guests here in the room have pre-registered. It's still, I hope, a, a diverse body of uh, opinion that you will all represent. But what it does mean is that it is a safe space. It's a safe space for people with different opinions to disagree. And I would beg you all uh, to treat those who don't agree with you with the utmost respect tonight. Now, as well as it being a live uh, audience here, we're going to be joined uh, by a global online audience. And there are three ways to plug into that discussion. Uh, the full event will be streamlined live at economist.com forward slash open future. Uh, we'll be posting clips too in near real time on The Economist's YouTube channel. And then we would urge everybody to conduct discussions uh, across social media using the hashtag OpenFuture. We've also done some social media polling. I don't know if we have them up here, but um, th th these uh, polling questions and answers will inform some of the evening. And I'll just read out two uh, quickly here. You can see them on the screen, can you? Um, do you think that global democracy is in decline or is it holding firm? A fairly strong view, and this is a, this is a, this is a global view, uh, is that it's in decline. Then there's a more specific question to do with Hong Kong. After a summer of protests, has Hong Kong cha changed forever? Now there the results are rather more even-handed. 53% believe it's changed, 47 believe it hasn't. I mean, I hope that later on we can kind of tease out sort of what that, uh, what that actually means. So um, what will happen next is that we, uh, we link up with Manchester. I would before then just like to introduce my colleagues and fellow moderators. Perhaps you could raise your hands here. Lena Shipper, who is the sole bureau chief. Rosie Blau, who is editor-in-chief of 1843 magazine. Simon Long, who is deputy digital editor and indeed former Banyan columnist. Miranda Johnson, our Southeast Asia columnist. And David Rennie, here, who is our Beijing bureau chief and uh, writer of the Chaguan column. So up next is Lena, and I'd like you, uh, please, to, to take over from here. Thank you very much to all of you. It's been fantastic that you have made it here, despite the difficulties. Uh, I'm grateful indeed to the panelists, as we all are, and to you, the audience, as well. And let the evening proceed. At the end of it, it'll be a dry one because uh, it's, it's three or more hours uh, without a break. But at the end of it, we'll make up uh, for that with some, some liquid refreshments and indeed some food. So he here's to the evening. Many thanks indeed.
Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Lena Schipper. I'm the uh, sole bureau chief for The Economist. And I'm going to take you through a session on activism and pragmatism around the world, together with my colleague in Manchester, Tom Standish. But before we go live to Manchester, please welcome to the stage Joshua Wong, the uh, Secretary General of Demosisto here in Hong Kong. Um, so yeah. And also um, Sokil Park, who's the country director in South Korea for Liberty in North Korea, which is an NGO that fights for the rights of North Koreans. Thank you both very much. And um, while we're waiting for the um, connection with Manchester to be established, maybe Joshua, you could tell us a bit about where you just came from, because I know you've just arrived from um, a probably slightly more active um, <laughs> activity than sitting in a chair on a stage. Yeah, I just came from the protest zone at, uh, from Causeway Bay to Admiralty. And even inside my bag, I have the gas mask to protect myself once police fire rubber bullets or tear gas. So we just imply that how Hong Kong is suffering a nightmare under the crackdown on protests. And what do you think is going to happen tonight while we're sitting in? Frankly speaking, it's hard for us to predict or estimate what will happen every night, especially since Hong Kong government formally announced to execute the emergency regulation ordinance, which just proved and also explained how the government or the administration bypass the legislature and to ignore the principle of separation of power. Yes, they, they passed and imposed the anti-mask law without the monitor and any legislation process in the future, will they use the same tactics or strategy to shut down the internet or cut the public transport? That is not surprise, just like the subway have already, the MTR have been shut down since yesterday midnight till now. And all we are aware that clash and protest with, will continue, but the government should be accountable and responsible to solve the political crisis by political system reform. Mm. Sakhil, does this remind you of something? <laughs> um, I, so I work on North Korea and I work with North Korean refugees and defectors uh, from South Korea. And uh, uh, there has not been that much reporting. You may not be surprised to hear in North Korean state media about what's happening here in Hong Kong, but not zero either. Uh, it's it's there's been some mentions in the, the Workers' Party paper and so on, and most of it is framed around reporting Beijing's criticism of the US in you know, their supposed interference in, in what's happening over here and so on. So you know, it's, it's really exciting to be here, and uh, it also reminds me of how far away North Korea is in terms of not having the conditions to even have this kind of expression of uh, you know, the okay. people's will. Great, I think we're just about to go live with Manchester now. Tom. With us, Nimco Ali, who is a writer and co-founder of the Five Foundation, which is a global partnership to end female genital mutilation. So please welcome Nimco. <laughs> Take a seat. And we also have Richard Ratcliffe, who is the husband of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, who has been held in Iran arbitrarily for the past three years. Welcome, Richard. <laughs> okay, now let's see if... Can you hear us in Hong Kong? Leda, can you hear us? Hi, Tom. We can hear you just fine. Hello, brilliant. Okay, so we're going we're to kick off. Um, so essentially, if you look at activism around the world, there seems to be an amazing sort of flowering of different approaches being taken to tackle these, uh, these deep-seated problems. So we had the school strike uh, for climate change. Uh, we had the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. And now we have what some people are calling the water revolution because of these unusual tactics that the protesters are using. Uh, be strong like ice, be fluid like water, gather like dew. Um, so all of these activists are campaigning for different things. So we want to hear from each of them about what they're doing. But we also want to try and draw some connections between them. Uh, to what extent can they learn from previous campaigns? To what extent can they learn from each other's campaigns? Uh, what does it take to bring about change in today's world? What can you do with 
with new tools. So we're going to start with Hong Kong. So over to you, Lena, and, um, and then we'll be coming back to hear from our panelists after a few minutes. Over to you, Lena. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, just before we went live to Manchester, we just chatted for a few minutes here about um, the, the things that Joshua has just been involved in and um, what that reminded Sakil about. So maybe we can start again by talking about um, what, what we um, discussed earlier about um, how much you think North Koreans would have heard about what's been going on in Hong Kong for the past few days and months and what that tells us about the differences between North Korea and Hong Kong. Yeah, sure. So uh, North Koreans uh, as a whole will have ha heard hardly anything about what's happening here in Hong Kong. Not nothing. You know, there's some North Koreans can go out to China and we'll hear a little bit more of global news from there. And there's been a tiny bit of reporting, as we just talked about, in the state media. But it's not really in detail about what's happening on the ground here. It's more about, uh, you know, reporting the Beijing's government's uh, criticism of the U.S. for their supposed interference in this issue and that kind of stuff. So there's, it's not a complete blackout, but, you know, it's, it's not that much at all. And uh, maybe one of the, thing, uh, the things that that points to is uh, maybe one of the fundamental differences here and when it, maybe one of the fundamental things about activism and democracy movements and so on, which is the importance of, I'm sorry to be a little bit cheesy, but the importance of hope, right? So I think that one of the key conditions here in Hong Kong is hope and momentum. And uh, that is something that the North Korean government has been so effective in denying the North Korean people. So if we maybe strip out a lot of the political factors and so on at a fundamental level, I think that why North Korea is how it is and why the chance of a people's movement and so on is so low is the North Korean government has been so effective in this kind of tyranny of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. North Korean people don't have a hope to gather and actually make a change. The only, the only way that they can imagine a change happening is if the leadership decides to go down a different pathway. Yeah, so given that difference, given the fundamental impossibility of political dissent within the country itself, how do you do political activism related to North Korea? What does it right. even involve? What's the strategy? Right, so uh, it's difficult, but I think that it starts with the study of the target. So uh, you have to study how the, the regime, the North Korean regime in this case, maintains power. And then maybe some of the ways that that's changing, maybe some of the ways that you know, there are fissures or friction where the North Korean government's control or ideologies may be breaking down in some ways and then trying to ident and identify ways that you can accelerate that, that you can work with the North Korean people to undermine the North Korean government's control or degrade their ideologies. And so that can look like different methods to get information and foreign media and so on to the North Korean people. And one of the main ways that our organization does it is by working with North Koreans who are leaving the country. So whether you want to call them refugees, defectors, or exiles, working with North Koreans who have left in order to try and empower them as agents of change back into the country. Mm. And how about in Hong Kong, Joshua? What, what would you say is... Um, changed in the democracy movement um, in the territory over the past sort of five years. So you had the umbrella movement and now um, we've had those protests for the past four months that have escalated quite badly over the past few days. Um, wh what, how's, how's your strategy developed throughout that time? Because you've been involved from the very beginning. Uh, Hong Kongers learned a lesson from the umbrella movement five years ago. In the past four months that I described as the summer of discontent, I think how Hong Kong people realize how to maximize our uniqueness to advocate and to facilitate the global solidarity campaign, it just keep our momentum and also put more pressure on Beijing. As we are aware that Hong Kong people are really efficient, effective and productive. And we are aware that if we need to seek and also increase more bargaining chip for Hong Kongers, uh, how Hong Kongers we have lots of overseas citizens live uh, in different global cities. And when we mobilize them to put pressure on Beijing government, it can really generate more pressure and also momentum. I remember on 29th of September, more than 60 cities around the world have Hong Kongers organized march, assembly or rally to put pressure on Beijing and just focus and emphasize on our fundamental cause on free election. 
which means universal suffrage, the chief executive should not handpick by Beijing. And then that's compared to five years ago, we learned a lesson and realized how to engage in international advocacy can just let Beijing to be aware that even they ignore the voice of Hong Kong people in Hong Kong, when with the uprising China model or Beijing to expand its influence, it needs to maintain its international reputation. And now what we have done in the past four months just prove and let the world to realize what is meant by the failure of the one country, two system. Mm. And uh, Sokka, what would you take from that, from you know, looking at the way that the Hong Kong movement uh, uses international mobilization, people outside, because you just said you also work a lot with North Koreans who have left. How, what could you take from, from that? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's a really important strategy, I think. And uh, there are efforts of North Korean exiles, North Korean refugees around the world to try and rally and to try and you know, put pressure on uh, different governments in the international community and trying to raise more support for the North Korean people. Maybe one of the weaknesses there is just the lack of North Korean exiles around the world, right? There's the most North Korean exiles in South Korea, and that's only about 30,000 people. And a lot of them are maybe not in the position of, you know, being able to engage that politically because they've just arrived in South Korea as refugees and so on. So there's maybe a weakness in the population in general in terms of uh, numbers and strength and so on. But nonetheless, it's something that we try and use and we, we try and uh, build a platform for North Koreans who have left the country to use their voice so that the world can see North Korea is not just Kim Jong-un and missiles, but see, the, see North Korea as a country from the perspective of North Korean people which I think is so lacking uh, in the conversation about that issue. Mm. And that, that idea of um, uh, one people fighting for something, that, that's become much more relevant in Hong Kong um, from an outside perspective over the past four months. How would you say that's, um, that's developed throughout the, um, throughout the movement, that, that sense of an idea, of an identity of Hong Kongers? I think the identity of Hong Kong is, is really remarkable and significant because in the previous day, previous day um, always for the generation of baby boomers in the last century, they may just recognize Hong Kong is the borrow place and borrow time and they just spend time here and even being recognized or defined by scholar as economic animal. But I think with the past four months with the determination and the commitment of Hong Kongers, how they pay the price and even sacrifice, hope to make change in the political system reform, which just proved that how with the sense of belongings and with the solidarity, they are really proud, and I'm part of them, to be Hong Kongers. And I also have to emphasize on the mobilization strategy that compared to five years ago. Five years ago in the umbrella movement is mainly led by student leaders just like me and uh, foreign media or international community will recognize us as the student leader of the umbrella movement, which will have a board of decision maker gathered by different student activist group or student union to mobilize people to continue the civil disobedience movement. But how we realize the limitation and the restriction of the top-down command uh, process and it's really exhausting and time consuming and also ignore the talents and uniqueness of Hong Kongers, how we are uh, more well educated and we are professional and we have lots of experience to continue the movement. So within the past four months protests, we have uh, realized how even with more decentralization mobilization platform where we will recognize us have the leaderless movement. Even we have no single individual leader that could represent a two or even three million population. Right. And on, yeah. on that note of leaderless movements, um, we're going to hand over to Tom in Manchester. Um, that's all we have time for in Hong Kong. Thank you very much, um, everyone in Hong Kong. Okay, Nimco, I'd like to come to you first, please. So um, you founded um, Daughters of Eve in 2010, um, and then later the Fly Foundation, you've also written a book. So tell us a bit about your, your activism journey and how you have campaigned in different ways over the years. 
Um, yeah, so I think it's really interesting here to, um, to, um, to be here in Manchester because my activism, I think, essentially did start here. I came back as a seven-year-old um, after being in Djibouti. Um, my, my life changed and with the consequence of FGM. And one of the key things I did was tell my teacher as a child, which was something I was meant to be ashamed of and, and embarrassed about, but I wasn't. So um, that was the basis of my activism, I think, was finally breaking the silence as a child. And what was interesting was that my teacher looked at me and as, as this person I was expecting to make the world seem a little bit more normal, told me that this was something normal for girls like me, which for the first time in a country which I felt at home, I felt so alienate, um, alienated. And that took me another 20 years to be really able to speak about the issue of FGM. And ultimately, we started Dr. Vive in 2010 in order to lobby the UK government around the issues of FGM because they were very much British girls like me who were being subjected to the um, practice. And for me, it was about lobbying the systems and the, and the, and the institutions. So at seven, I was dismissed by, by, by my teacher. At 11, I was in a major hospital in Cardiff with serious complications from FGM. And again, nothing was done. So I thought if the real institutions don't care about British girls, then nothing can really happen. And then in 2013, um, having successfully worked with the coalition government, um, um, DFID, the Department for International Development, committed 36 million to lead the African-led movement because a lot of the work that's happening around FGM is being led on the, on the African continent. And the Five Foundation has a successful um, move from the domestic into the in international work. And I think the UK work um, has come to its fruition by the fact that last year um, the FGM was added to the, to the Children's Act. And I know the fact that if another child like me was at risk of FGM, she'd be protected. But now it's about supporting the African-led movement. And within the book that I wrote, which is called Things We're Not Told, to, Things We're Told Not to Talk About, was essentially that whole concept of shame. Um, the female anatomy is very much policed by culture and religion around the world. It doesn't matter whether you're Somali, whether you're East Africa, um, rural East African, or even living in East London. Ultimately, women are not told to talk about their experiences. And for me, breaking the silence has been the fundamental basis of my activism and not being ashamed of something that happened to me, but really trying to get the world to understand that. So I think that's been the connection between a daughter of which was a personal endeavor to the five foundation which is a global activism program to really um, ensure that we end fgm by 2030 okay and what form does the um the activity of the five foundation take so what can you actually do on the ground what are the what are the the tactics in practice so the fundamental role of the five foundation is a global partnership the work to end fgm is being done by women on, on the front line in africa and at the moment only two percent of global for, um, funding goes to the women in africa who are doing this work though women who have actually put the agenda of fgm on the table who've taken it to the un so so what i do personally is, is to elevate those stories to get the department for international development public finance and um, public and private sectors in order to, to invest in that so for us so for me is to be an advocate on behalf of the women that are really doing the work um, on, on, um, and on the ground in Africa and trying to get, get the funding there. Right, so trying to get that 2% to, to go up. What's the, where's the rest of it going then? International organizations. So at the moment is the fact that I will be honest that the international development um, agenda is very racist and sexist. So we don't trust African women to be the real agents of change. So we are committing money to the issue of FGM, but that's getting sucked up at national level. So we have people in Kenya. When it comes to Kenya, it's the most successful country in tackling FGM, so it's gone down to about 21%. So, but the money at the moment is, is stuck in the um, capital cities. And ultimately, you've got the Spamburu region, which FGM is at 98%. And women who are like, you know, saving girls are not getting the money. So it's a lot of bureaucracy where the fact that we are trusting large NGOs as opposed to women on the front line, it doesn't take millions in order to end FGM, but, but it does take the my minute number of um, amount of monies that we have to be spent well and to be given to the women that are really doing the work. So um, large NGOs have joined the Five Foundation as much as um, on the ground activism as well. Okay, great. Uh, Richard, that's come to you now. Um, so your wife was um, imprisoned a bit more than what, three and a half years ago now. So what's your, th you were sort of, you had activism thrust upon you as it were. What's your, how's your approach changed and what's the state of play at the moment? Uh, that's exactly right. It, um, it's a real privilege to be here, given um, I'm here with some proper activists rather than obviously um, our story is, is yeah, I uh, you know, stumbled into this with a middle-aged accountant. Uh, Nazi, my wife, was arrested on holiday and, and we've mud muddled our way through it. Um, I think to pick up on what some of the other speakers have said, um, for me, the most important part of my activism is, is campaigning, it's, it's speaking out, it's raising Nazanin's story to the world at large to be able to come to events like this. 
Um, and it's also keeping hope alive that actually, you know, part of being an activist is, is being belligerent and difficult. And it's just, the world doesn't have to be like this. This is nonsense. And just to keep battling away. And, and um, it, for me, that's changed over time. At the beginning, I just talked about our story. Gradually, I, I, I you know, calmed down and realized other people were going through it. There are other situations. There are things you can learn from lots of different ways. So this is part of a broader trend that um, Iran has been um, essentially taking hostages. And uh, do people know about that? You're trying to raise awareness of the bigger picture as well as your individual story. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That, that there is, Iran's not unique, but it's quite prominent in doing it in, in a practice of, of certain countries taking hostages for leverage um, with other countries. Um, and at the beginning, you think, well, what, you know, I'm innocent, this is not... And you realise, actually, other people are also struggling, and then you realise that, actually, there's a... It's quite tough for diplomats to acknowledge this is what's going on, and you do need to, to, to put it bluntly, and if you don't call yourselves hostages, no-one else will. Um, I think the other thing to pick up on what, what some of the speakers were saying um, over in Hong Kong, for me, with campaigning, you know, a lot of what is just getting noticed and just trying different ways to creatively... And, and actually, that no one's... No one's in trouble. Right. No one's in charge. Um, it, it, there's kind of a creative anarchy the whole time of, of looking for different things to do. So, for instance, recently summer we had a, a hunger strike um, that, that we didn't plan on doing. It just Nazni went on when I joined her. Um, we set up in front of the Iranian embassy to, to do it. And actually then lots of supporters, it wasn't us, came along and started decorating the walls of the embassy with post-it notes that they'd seen the guys in, New, in Hong Kong doing. And there was a way in which actually you know, a lot of campaigning is, is making it up as you go along, um, just to keep on trying, keep on hoping, keep on battling, keep on being clear that, listen, you know, world notice this is not acceptable. The authorities won't, and, and the job is to, to be belligerent. So um, grateful for the opportunity. And so you, have to, so you have to constantly change tactics is, is, is sort of part of There's no right way of doing this. Yeah, there, you know, you can try something, it'll work for a while, and then it won't work. Um, some things will work much better than expected. Some things will, will not work. Um, some things will not work and then will work. Um, and there's a lot of, of sort of just patience and, and, and energy. Um, and I think it was really well put from, a, from, a, from the guys in, in, in Hong Kong. The most important thing is to keep that hope that it, you know, the world can be different, the world should be different, and, and you know, by God will I make it. OK, well, I'd like to open up to questions now. And in fact, Nimco, you had a question for Richard, didn't you, about, um, about work-life balance, as it were? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think we are both thrown into the whole um, issue of activism, and I think um, self-care is a fundamental thing that I didn't understand. So I just wanted to really ask, like, how do you take care of yourselves in order to stay um, strong, in order to be able to continue with the uh, campaign? Yeah, so I think there's two answers. To that. The first is, I mean, in some ways, I find there is an energy that comes from campaign. Partly, ours is a very specific story. Like, I'm battling for my family. And so there's a, you know, sitting silently, not doing anything was much harder than battling. But, but there is always a tension between, I mean, for me, kind of between being a campaigning husband and being a real husband and a real dad. Um, and you can see it in particular at the moment. So we've got, we've got a, a decision to make about bringing Gabriella home. It's my daughter. This is your daughter, uh, who's now at a school age. And so you've made this very difficult decision or are in the process of making this decision about bringing her home. Yeah, and probably I've made a decision and then we've had to wait a while for Nazanin to be ready for it. And, and it, it's tough. And it's tough both in terms of, of the mechanics of that happening and, and the disruption. And also the, I mean, one of the consequences of always being in the media is that, that this is a human story that people follow. And then it's, it's tough to manage what is a little girl adapting to, you know, leaving a mummy, leaving a granny. And, and but Nimco, how do you deal with this, with the, um, with the kind of... The, not, you can't be campaigning all the time. How do, you, how do you get away from it? Do you go running? Do you do something else? Um, I do get up at 7 a.m. to go to the gym these days, but ultimately that was uh, a personal journey that I had to find because I am fighting a 4,000-year-old traditional practice which ultimately has blighted the life of 200 million women in the world. Um, and for me, I think it's one of the key things is that I can't be an FGM survivor and be myself, so I have to be one on the other. And ultimately, it has been difficult trying to have that conversation with people and the first thing they see is to ask about the FGM as opposed to why I watch some TV and everything else. So it has been a difficult um, conversation and it has also been a difficult journey. But ultimately, I think the, the media conversation was very interesting that hope is a fundamental thing that when I talk about FGM, I don't talk about, I talk about the numbers, but I also talk about the fact that by 2030 that we could be living in a world for the first time that girls are free from FGM. So I think hope, hope sells a lot more than horror. And that was a fundamental thing that I chose when I first came out. I didn't say I was a victim of FGM. I said I was a survivor. But I think there's also a level of um, disrespect 
to the survivors of sexual violence or other forms of um, violence when it comes to telling their own stories. And I'm very protective about other survivors and saying the fact that the media can be very voyeurish at the times. And it's like, you know, we are more than just what happened to our anatomy. And I think that's something that I'm really passionate about saying um, a lot right now. OK, now we're going to try using the, uh, the link up with Hong Kong, because, Richard, you had a question for Joshua, I believe. So, um, so can you hear us in Hong Kong? Yeah. Hi, Joshua. Hello. Uh, Hi. So, so <laughs> my question would be, I mean, it's almost that sustaining energy. I, I know I find with us with campaigning, it's been, what, three years now, that it, I, it, I thought it'd be a sprint, and it's turned out to be a marathon. So I just wanted to know how you managed to, what is a long struggle, keep the energy of the movement going. In such uphill battle, and it's really a struggle. When we experienced the crackdown on human rights in the past five years, I've been arrested for eight times and being jailed for three times, but just spending around 120 days in prison, and the price I pay is really small. I think uh, for my personal journey, engaged in street <coughs> activism or social movement is the process of self-actualization, to turn something impossible to be possible. Uh, when we knew our friends and colleagues being jailed and arrested in the past three or four months, more than 2,000 Hong Kongers were arrested. The youngest one at the age of 10 is a 10 years old primary school kid. It would just encourage uh, us to realize that how facing the largest authoritarian regime in the world, we have no chance and no room for us to step backward or to regret, and we still need to continue the fight. So sometimes we'll be a bit depressed and having the struggle, but I think how families and friends and religious as a Christian, it really helps me a lot. OK, now I'd like to see if we have any questions from the floor here. If you do have one, could you wave your yes card in the air? Because that will be easier for me to see. We have a question over here. First question of the day. Please go get a mic over to here. Here it comes. And if you could um, wait for it to appear. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, to, to Mr. Ratcliffe, so certainly uh, there has been a lot of press coverage about Mazanin, and you um, talked about bringing her story to the wider world. So do you think that this knowledge of her, of her situation in Iran, do you think that this has helped her in the sense that people are certainly more aware of what is happening to hostages in Iran, but equally a regime like that has perhaps capitalized off that as a diplomatic tool. So what is your view on that? Thank you. Very good question. Go ahead. Yeah, good question. Um, it, yes, it's definitely double-edged. Um, I mean, my, my honest sense is that speaking out about Nazanin protects her. Um, and there's a way in which abuses can happen in silence that are, are not able to happen in, in public. Um, it also makes it more complicated diplomatically. Um, and there are arguments I have with the Foreign Office, the British government, all the time around um, you know, so they, they're they like, keep quiet, keep quiet, we'll broadly, sort this out. Broadly, and, and, and to be fair, it's not entirely disingenuous. There are moments where it is a bit, but, but um, I, th I think empirically, there's no evidence that, that keeping quiet helps in any other cases. Keep speaking out, it's a lot easier to keep it protected. Um, and certainly, I think, yeah, the, 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 the benefits of having her in the light and of her knowing that she's looked after and cared for certainly overweigh the risk. OK, brilliant. Right, do we have any more questions on the floor? We have one down here. Do we have any more while I'm looking around? Yes, we have another one over there. So we'll come to you in a minute. Go ahead, please. Oh, wait, is the mic up? Oh, is it working? Is it, can we have a working microphone? OK. Where's the other microphone that we just had? Is this the same one? I think we've got a spare one down here. So why don't we try this one? Hello. Does it work? It does. <laughs> That's called a sound check. Yes, that's a question for Joshua. Uh, I'm not sure that violence really is the answer. And as violence escalates, it just gives the other side more and more reasons to get involved and start repressing things. I mean, think about what happened at Tiananmen Square, for example. So how come the people in Hong Kong have... Uh, you know, why don't they follow, uh, take a leaf out of somebody like Mahatma Gandhi's book? in terms of uh, uh, a peaceful right. protest, which would make it a lot harder for the authorities to clamp down hard on them. Excellent so question. Did you hear that in Hong Kong? Yes. The use, the, go ahead, Joshua. We strongly realize how force has been used by protesters 
or activists in the past few months, but instead of condemn on any kind of force used by the side of protester, I think it's how government teach Hong Kong people peaceful protest is useless or at least not effective in love. We have one fourth of population, 25% of citizens, two million people take to the street with our cause on free election. But when life threatening weapon were used by riot police, it's just generated more and more discontent, especially we just realized how they turned Hong Kong from a global city to a police state. Especially they are not only targeting activists, they even targeted journalists, even first aider, even one journalist result in permanent blindness because being fired by rubber bullets. So when government refused to conduct any kind of systematic reform, it was just trigger more and more reason for people to aware that they need to continue their protests no matter with the incentives of self-protection or self-defense. Even it may be difficult for everyone in Hong Kong agree on all the behaviors of protesters. But all we are aware is how Hong Kong government is just the puppet of Beijing and refuse to be responsible or accountable and just send out riot police with those lethal weapons and even use live round bullets fired towards a 14 years old School kid, is this the solution? So I would say that escalation of force or escalation of violence might not be the good, might ge not generated positive impression around the world. But we still need to realize what is the fundamental problem. What is the root cause for more than 25% of population took to the street? And finally, in conclusion, if 25% of population in UK took to the street, I believe the government might resign immediately. But it didn't happen in Hong Kong because here is Hong Kong without democracy. Yeah, I'm not sure what we think about whether Boris and his, his pals would resign. <laughs> seem to be possible to get. They seem to have no shame. Anyway, uh, we had another question over here, and th uh, the holy microphone has been returned to here. Does this microphone work? Hi. It does. Go ahead, please. It works. Um, so this is for Ms. Nimcom. Um, so you talked about um, that the majority of money and funds that go to Africa um, do not reach the target. Uh, they don't behind you. get to um, <laughs> they don't get to African women. So how do we tackle this corruption? How do we release these funds? And how how do we make them um, reach the target? Thank you. Um, thank you. That's an incredible question. And one of the key things is that each and every one of us has a role to play in that because we're taxpayers and we're voters and 0.7% of our GDP is committed to in international development. That's 14 billion every year that we want to be able to give to the world developing countries. And at the moment, and, and it's for us to make the case for African women, it's for us to make the case for direct funding. Um, at the moment, um, DIFID is an incredible organization, but it's very restricted and very scared. It's scared of um, Daily Mail front pages of saying we're wasting 100 million here, like you know, a million there. So it's for us to make the case to say that if we really do want to change the world, that if we do really want to ensure that the Sustainable Development Goals targets are met, that we fight for women and that we fund women. So whenever there's an election coming up, each and every one of those people that are knocking on your door um, should be asked, are they going to be funding women on the front line of ending FGM directly? Because ending FGM is ultimately sustainable to environmental issues, into global warming, to global peace. And there is nowhere in the world where FGM is more than 40% where there is prosperity, success, and security. And that is not, and that, and that is not a, co a co coincidence. Where you break the most vulnerable people in society, there will be um, disaster and there will be disease. So ultimately, it is about us as citizens and us as taxpayers really making a case to governments. And, there's our, and there are some incredible people in government at the moment. So DFID is very much committed to that. And if you work in the private sector, it's easier to get your money to the front line there than it is to get government aid money. So I would say each and every one of you can become an activist and really like, you know, ask your MPs to ensure that when money is being sent away, it's being sent to the right places. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, we're going to go over to Hong Kong now, and they're going to have some questions from that end. Over to you, Lena. Yes, we do, and I think the first question is going to come from Sokil, who's uh, sitting on the stage next to me. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll throw a question back to Manchester and to Nimco, and I'd like to ask, you know, since you've been working uh, so much on, uh, you know, uh, gender rights and female rights and improved uh, empowerment in Africa, 
Is there anything that you've identified in terms of approaches or tactics that might be applied anywhere? And when I say anywhere, maybe even as far as North Korea? <laughs> Um, I believe in a very, um, like, you know, ac-local thing, global um, kind of theory, and ultimately it's about doing our history. It's doing our history and learning from the women that came before us. I stand on the shoulders of incredible women from the African continent who've actually led the path in order for me to be here. So I think it's about giving back and understanding that we're not the first people to come up with an idea, and, and, and it doesn't matter where you are, whether it's your grandmother, whether it's your mother, whether it's um, the, the suffragettes here in the UK and in Manchester specifically, there is always history in what, in, 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 in what you want to do. And if you want to advocate for the future, it's about looking at the past and really giving thanks and setting your foundations upon the women that came before you. And I know that there's probably in, in, in incredible women in North Korea who've been doing some incredible stuff. And the most successful women are not always the loudest women there, the women that push the next generation forward. And I've been immensely privileged to have a lot of those women in my life and a lot of those women to look up to. So I think giving back and understanding that we're here because of great women whose names we might not know but have sacrificed a lot for us. So that would be my advice is not to think that you're the first person to think of the activism which you want to kind of take forward. Great. Thanks so much, Manchester. Um, do we have any questions from the floor in Hong Kong? You can ask both our panelists on stage here and also the two um, on stage at Manchester. Yeah? Um, I have a question. Uh, wait for the <laughs> microphone, so everybody in Manchester needs to hear you too. <laughs> um, I have a question for Joshua. So before the panel started, we saw a poll from The Economist showing how some people think that the a movement going on in Hong Kong will change Hong Kong forever, and some think it won't, and it's about 50-50. So I remember being in middle school watching the Hong Kong democracy movement and thinking this was gonna absolutely revolutionize Hong Kong, change it all, and it did die down five years ago. So I'm asking you, do you think this movement will change Hong Kong forever, and how it is or will not be different? Um, from my personal observation and participation in the past four months, I left prison uh, uh, one day after two million people took to the street. And I strongly experienced it will change Hong Kong forever. Especially, it just imply how the fundamental difficulties for Beijing to rule Hong Kong with stability and prosperity if they still refuse to let Hong Kong people enjoy free election. For example, uh, yesterday, Hong Kong government announced their emergency uh, status and to impose the anti-mask law, which just bypassed the legislature. And if they bypass the legislature uh, yesterday, they can also impose any law just bypass the legislature without any consultation. And with how they transformed Hong Kong to be a police state with more violence, in the previous day, when you ask people who live around the world, what is their imp uh, impression on Hong Kong? Perhaps it might be a global financial center, international city, or maybe with Chinese restaurant, with Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan, or etc. That's people's general perception in Hong Kong. But now, when under the hardline rule of President Xi, the only or the most impressive or the most important issue that in people's minds is about protests in Hong Kong. And it's just proof that Beijing hoped to rule Hong Kong with one country, two system. But when they broke the promise in the Sino-British Joint Declaration, in the international treaty that registered in the United Nations, it's just proof that it's not only how one country, two system changed to be one country, one and a half system, but even it's the fail and the fall of the one country, two system fail of the current constitutional framework. So why I would say Hong Kong will change forever, and there's no way for us to go back. It's because we all realize that when they just continue to conduct mass arrests and prosecution and to generate a white terror or chilling effect, it's not only targeted ordinary citizens or youngsters just like me, even business sector or the open business environment in Hong Kong is already under threat and it will change the whole world, uh, it will just change, fundamentally change the world reputation on Hong Kong's, is, is still the global financial center or is just a financial city under the hardline rule of Beijing. I think that's the fundamental differences to let Hong Kong turn no way back.
any more. Thank you. Um, any more questions from the floor? Yes, over there. Thank you. I have a question for Joshua as well. And uh, you mentioned the importance of international advocacy and uh, mobilization. So um, apart from uh, transnational organized movements, you yourself also went to um, Washington to talk to US lawmakers. And some people say that these uh, efforts are futile. So um, how, to what extent do you think that these um, discussions with foreign governments can actually have an impact on uh, what's happening in Hong Kong? With the trade war chaos, Taiwan presidential election, and how Belt and Road Initiative hope to expand in Europe face restriction. Without this free factor, will Hong Kong government and Beijing completely withdraw the bill on early September? I doubt on it. When we recognize Hong Kong as the global city, Hong Kong's mass matter to the world, and also international relation on international dynamics also affect the decision made by President Xi to Hong Kong. It's the first time pro pre for President Xi Jinping compromised to Hong Kong people in the, in the past few years under his leadership. So I would say that made with US or UK lawmaker to seek for bipartisan support is we just hope to prove that support Hong Kong's democratization or not is the mat it's not the matter of right or left. It's just a matter of right or wrong. And that's the reason we hope the voice of Hong Kong people, even, even not being heard in Beijing, but it can still be heard in the international community. Anybody got any questions for Manchester, maybe? <laughs> no? OK. Over there? Oh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Joshua, uh, a lot of things have been achieved obviously in the last few months, but where we are today is also, it's a difficult situation. I wouldn't say a deadlock, but it's a difficult situation. So now going back to let's say June, May, right? What would you say the protesters, the movement should have done differently maybe, or maybe what, what would you say maybe I should have done things differently in order to have maybe advanced even further or done things a little bit differently in a way that would have made the government response to respond differently. I'm wondering whether there are any, any learnings from, from your side. Hong Kong is under the rule of largest authoritarian regime in the world, and the deadlock is generated by them. Uh, when one million people took to the street on 9th of June, and two million people in Hong Kong took to the street on 16th of June, I was also in prison. So I would say that if, uh, but I would say that if Hong Kong government decide to completely withdraw the e bill on mid of June, I don't expect or assume this movement will continue for more than 100 days. And now I think it's the question for President Xi or for Beijing. What Hong Kong people are asking for, perhaps the behaviors or what have been done by protesters might not be widely accepted by all of the people around the world. But when the fundamental cause are just asking for free election, which means universal suffrage. We hope to elect our own government. The leader of the Hong Kong should not be only manipulated by Beijing. If this promise or if this demand go too far, if not, when will Hong Kong and Beijing government to solve the deadlock? I think it depends on them instead of depends on us. Cool. We've got one time for one more, I think. Um, yeah, first row. Thank you. I believe we all um, support the fight for freedom and democracy, but sometimes I'm wondering whether um, the protesters are fighting the wrong battle. Shouldn't, be, shouldn't the focus be on um, you know, f fairness and uh, higher uh, quality of life in Hong Kong? I mean, it's a f you know, Hong Kong is a fairly uh, unfair um, uh, society. So just wondering, What's your point of view on, on, on what the battle should be? When the Legislative Council of Hong Kong can't represent the voice of people, when lawmaker that democratically elected will be unseat, candidate hope to run for office will be disqualified, and journalists based at Hong Kong will be expelled out from Hong Kong. Of course, we hope to have a fair society, we hope to have, eco we hope to have reform to care more about labor rights, care more about the, mi the voice of minority. But the fundamental difficulties and the problem is if the government is not elected by us, 
We can't even have a vote to vote on the election day. On every election day for the chief executive in Hong Kong, such a place with 7 million population, only 1,200 upper class elites can vote in the election. So if we can't even get a vote, how can we expect a reform on social policy or reform our society to care more about elderly, care more about youngsters, to enhance the upward mobility of the millennials for the Gen X, or etc. That's why on early June, people only focus on the evil bill, which means the extradition bill. But later on, people realize that if the government is not elected by us, if we even can't get a vote, how can we expect them, they will listen to the, our voice. If the government is just appointed by Beijing, oh, finally, President Xi will just be the only voters to decide what should be the next step of Carrie Lam. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop you right there because we're now going to um, go back to Manchester. Um, where the session is going to close, um, and Daniel Franklin is going to start talking about. Anyway, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Daniel Franklin, who is going to be running the next session. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Okay. So Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And our, our next session really follows on, I think, from uh, very much from that terrific uh, uh, discussion it's on journalism in a post-truth world. And to discuss this with me, I'd like to welcome Victor Mallet, who's the Bureau Chief of the Financial Times in Paris. Victor. So, Victor, there's very much a Hong Kong connection here, too, because before you were in Paris, uh, you were Bureau Chief in Hong Kong. And then your visa was not renewed. So, for those of you in this room who aren't familiar with this story. Victor, tell us briefly what happened and why you were, in, a, in essence, kept out of Hong Kong. Thanks very much. I mean, as you've just heard, there isn't democracy in Hong Kong, but there always has been freedom of information and freedom of the, freedom of the press. Very, very, very vigorous. Very vigorous. Right. And, and in a way, this was the sort of beginnings of a Chinese government attempt, I think, to, to shut that down. Uh, sadly, I can't say it was a brilliant article that I wrote for the Financial Times about oppression in China or anything like that. It was actually much more simple. I happened to be the vice president of the press club. We had invited um, actually a little known politician, uh, um, Andy Chan, to speak at the Foreign Correspondents Club, which is you know, the biggest, best known press club in Asia. Uh, we, we do these lunches you know, every week, uh, several times a week in some cases. Um, and um, what happened was that the Chinese government called me in, uh, foreign ministry people, and said, you have to cancel this speech, this meeting. And uh, I said, well, I'll take it to the board of the club, but we obviously can't cancel it because there's free speech in Hong Kong. And um, the meeting went ahead. There were demonstrations pro and anti. Uh, it was probably one of the club's uh, you know, best broadcast and most popular meetings ever because it, was, it had become such a cause celeb because the Chinese government had tried to shut it down. They didn't shut it down. Uh, but then subsequently, yes, my visa was not renewed, and then I wasn't allowed entry into the country. But this was a very, very small affair. When you think of what's followed, but it was, a, it was a sort of canary in the coal mine, which is what makes it interesting. I don't, I don't want to sort of big it up, but it, but it is also another interesting example of how uh, what could have been just ig ignored and, 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 and disappeared, and no one would have noticed, it suddenly becomes a, a sort of cause célèbre. Uh, and and they, 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 they sort of mishandled it, didn't they? Because they made it bigger than it would otherwise have been. I think that's right. I mean, you just heard Joshua Wong, Wong saying something similar, that, you know, if they had simply backed down when there was this massive peaceful demonstration, things would have changed. I think uh, when you look at the, the way the media and information flows in Hong Kong and China, I think one of the big mistakes that the Chinese government has made, and by extension the Hong Kong government, is simply not to have listened to the Hong Kong people and what they wanted, which was freely available in the media. But when you had debates with Chinese officials in Hong Kong, they were actually not really willing to debate or listen. Ten years ago, uh, Beijing was actually pretty popular in Hong Kong. Young Hong Kong people actually felt proud. It was the Beijing Olympics, 2008. Uh, and then in the subsequent ten years, you had this dramatic decline of the Communist Party's popularity because of the way Beijing began to constrain uh, increasingly the freedoms of people of Hong Kong. You know, they didn't allow uh, elected people to sit in the Legislative uh, Council and so on and so on. And, you know, after my very minor incident of, of not getting into the country, we had uh, professors of politics who were put in jail 
for under some obscure colonial law, uh, you know, incitement to incite a public nuisance because of their role in the uh, largely peaceful umbrella protests of, of 2014. Now we want to focus particularly on journalism. And although you've left Hong Kong, not everybody quite realizes this. And sort of right on cue last night, you've been at the center of a, of a mini social media store. And I, I mentioned this because it's sort of uh, interesting as, as a, an example of a way, the way that the media can work and flare up in, in today's social media uh, maelstrom. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very weird thing. I started getting these angry messages from, from uh, Hong Kongers, you know, pro-Beijing Hong Kongers mostly, sort of saying, why did you do that? This you, is last night. Yeah, last Probably, night. Yeah, yeah. Why did you do that, you bastard? And I haven't had these kind of messages for quite a long time. <laughs> and I couldn't work out what had happened. And it turns out um, that there was a rather nasty incident where somebody who was speaking mainland Chinese, Putonghua, uh, he may have been Taiwanese for all I know, but anyway, he was walking down the street. He was apparently harassed by people. This is all captured on a social media video. And then he tries to sort of get away into a building. Uh, and then there's a photographer who's wearing a face mask who, who blocks his path to take a photo. And at this point, the man who's speaking Chinese is punched uh, in the face, I think. Uh, and it all gets very unpleasant. Uh, and you know, it tells you a lot about divisiveness in Hong Kong society. But somehow, somebody put out a thing saying, this cameraman who blocked his way was the wicked Victor Mallet, that's me. And of course, it wasn't because I can't be in Hong Kong because I can't get in. Uh, but you know, it's amazing how quickly and, and terrifying how quickly this yeah. spread. And all this hate speech, uh, you know, immediately arrived uh, on my doorstep, or you know, rather over the internet. And, uh, and you know, I've had friends saying, "What happened? What, what is this, all this about you doing this terrible thing?" And I've had to explain, "Well, it wasn't me." Yes, and I want, I want to broaden this out to the world. It's not just Hong Kong, obviously. You're now in Paris. Interesting to come back. Not your first time in Paris to come back to to France at a very different sort of media world than when you were first there. What are your impressions of, of the, the state of, of media freedoms in, in, in the European context? France has its own sort of anger at the moment that you see in the Gilets Jaunes movement, for example. And we, we had, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the Charlie Hebdo tragedy. So t tell us about Yeah, France. I think, you know, I, I, I mean, I do think this is a global phenomenon, this kind of divisiveness. Um, it's quite new in Hong Kong, I think, this sort of sense of division in society and, and actually a lot of hate on both sides. Uh, in France, it's quite noticeable as well with the Gilets Jaunes. These are the sort of anti-government protesters. It started as a, as a motorist protest against rising fuel prices and green taxes, but it then developed into a much broader kind of anti-government uh, and actually now sort of anti-establishment, anti-capitalist movement. So it's, it's morphed over time. But the, but the interesting thing is that as in the US uh, over Trump, as in Britain over Brexit, and now in France over the government and the Gilets Jaunes, you do have a, a sort of very divided society and a lot of hate speech, which is often, you know, divisive incidents are often pro promoted, we see by Russian media, for example. You know, they don't necessarily make it up but they'll push it into the public domain. And, and you get everybody shouting at each other and very angry with each other. And it's only when people actually talk to each other, uh, you know, even over email or, or in person, that actually tempers cool. So it's, it's quite a sort of dangerous medium. But I was very struck in the last uh, few months, years, by you know, these appalling headlines. I think it was the Daily Mail that had a headline saying, enemies of the people above a picture of three uh, British judges because they had decided that Parliament should have the final say in the, the Brexit arrangements. You've had Donald Trump talking about uh, the press being enemies of the people. I mean, these are very, very dangerous uh, kind of statements to make and very extreme statements to make, I think. And, you know, everyone needs to cool down a bit. I think. Well, that's easy yeah. to say, but I don't, don't see much sign of it. Let's take some questions, uh, first of all, here, and then we'll, we'll go to Hong Kong. We still have uh, uh, Lena with us, I believe, in Hong Kong. So any questions uh, here for, yes, over down at the bottom here, if we could get a microphone. I'll look at you on the screen. Yes, <laughs> behind you here. Yes. So the, the topic was posed to how do you stop it where, when you have political, I suppose, referendums or campaigns? How do you actually stop uh, basically lies and misstatements going out without censorship? Because a lot of people just get conned where they listen to things. I mean, if you can write anything on the side of a bus and it's believed. So how do you actually legitimately stop How that? does the media stop? Is that the, is that well, the question? Or how does the society how, in general? How does society in general stop that? Because finally, there's no point running these things again and what have you. Because if people are going to lie, they're going to carry on lying. So how do you stop political lies in campaigns? That's it's a good question. I mean, I think what the media has to do is to keep plugging away at doing its job well and properly and, you know, 
a lot of the a lot of the hate on social media is actually originates and all the opinions generated actually originate in very standard news stories written by traditional journalists, whether they work for the BBC or The Economist or the FT or the Wall Street Journal or Reuters or Agence France Presse. These people are still going about their jobs reporting on the news. And then there's a lot of comment that is piled onto that uh, on social media. And I, I think probably the one thing that the media can do better uh, is uh, to um, get out from the capital city. You know, I happen to live in France and France French uh, sort of political life and economic life is incredibly centered on the capital, Paris. And um, so, so a lot of people... taken by surprise. Yeah, a lot of people didn't happened. see the gilets jaunes coming. And I, I think you can say exactly the same about Donald Trump in America. You know, maybe the press, the traditional press, if you like, was guilty of not spending enough time in the Midwest talking to the people who voted for Trump. In Britain, I think the same is true. Not enough of us went out to Felixstowe or Manchester or a small country town uh, you know, in Essex and talk to people and ask them what they thought about Brexit. And, and do you see that changing as a matter of interest? Do you think, I mean, coming back to France now with this sort of uh, lesson learned, are you getting out of Paris more? Uh, I, I always want to. And of course, it's very difficult because a lot of companies are based in Paris and the government is based in Paris. But yes, I think probably uh, the best media, which is you and me, I hope, you know, we have, we have tried to learn from our mistakes. Whether that is the case with everybody, I don't know. I mean, there is a... There There's is a, an economic problem in that, 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 that local media is finding it quite hard to survive. That's that, absolutely true. I mean, especially in the United States, and I think yet yeah, in Britain as well, the, the loss of the local newspaper is a fundamental problem. Uh, you know, and you can see this the way that, you know, local council meetings are not reported anymore, and, and you just have everything done from somebody in London or Manchester, and it's not the same as having a, a really local sort of media, uh, you know, that, that is picking things up and, and, and running with them. There's a question right at the back there, and then I'm going to go to Hong Kong uh, to you, Lena, and ask if there's a question for, 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 for Victor from Hong Kong, perhaps on Hong Kong. Right at the back there. Yeah, the microphone's waiting to get to you. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Farhad Ahmed. I'm, in, I'm a young imam. Um, looking at things from a Muslim perspective, a lot of young Muslims that I speak to, they feel there's negative coverage of Muslims, despite the fact that they're doing a lot to serve Britain through man hours and woman hours in terms of serving Britain, spending in charity, but still there's a lot of negativity. Uh, and I think that's damaging for the media, for the future of the media. And what advice would you give to young Muslims, what they can do more to reach out to the media, but also what can the British media do more? Thanks. I'm not an expert on this subject, but uh, but I do have but a similar in France. Too, uh, isn't I was going to say, you know, my kind of immediate knowledge is, is really about France, where it's also a problem. In fact, probably a bigger problem. There's a, a bigger, there's a very large Muslim community in, in, in France. And there is a lot of Islamophobia. There's also a lot of anti-Semitism. And there's a lot of uh, division. And in fact, I would say that in France, it's even worse in the sense that uh, communities are much more ghettoized, they're much more separated than they are uh, in the UK. That's my impression anyway. Uh, and I think, you know, the advice on both sides is simply to talk to people more. You know, I noticed that when, when you have all this hate speech stuff, uh, it's amazing how quickly people cool down when you actually respond to their message and say, actually, it's not like that, it's like this. And, but I'm prepared to talk about it. So I think, you know, it's incumbent on journalists and the media to engage with people, even when they're initially very aggressive, because very soon people become less aggressive if you respond. And in the same way, I think it's incumbent on people who have particular grievances or particular issues they want to discuss, whether it's uh, the treatment of Muslims or, or anything else, to, to sort of go to the media and, and maybe not uh, and talk to people, but maybe not do it in, a, in an initially incredibly aggressive way, which tends to put people off. And you know, people only have so much time in the day. And, of course, nobody can respond to every single social media message. Uh, but if you get a, a reasonable request, it's like you know comments on the bottom of our stories. Uh, in my newspaper on our website, we have a lot of comments on the bottom of the stories. And you notice that uh, when, uh, when there's just a bunch of abuse from pro or anti-Brexiters, nothing really happens. When you get an intelligent comment on the bottom of a story, whether it's about India and Kashmir or about Brexit or Trump, then intelligent people respond, and you then get an interesting and intelligent debate going on. And it's quite important to promote that rather than sort of having people just, you know, toing and froing with each other in a hostile manner. I wonder, 
uh, go to Hong Kong if we can. Lena, are you there? Can you, yes, uh, would you are. like to ask a question? Or hi, take a hi question? Victor. Uh, Hello, Victor and Daniel. Hello, Victor from hi. your old home. Um, do we have any questions from the audience in Hong Kong? Yes, first row, right there. <coughs> We're just getting the mic ready for you. Hello, Hong Kong, I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> I know that person. Hi, Victor. Um, hi, Victor. Um, you mentioned lessons learned from Trump and Brexit. Um, I was just wondering if you think that there are lessons that international media should um, reflect upon, things that international media should think about in the case of reporting in Hong Kong as well. Um, I guess for that question, one thought that I want to share is that think about the case of Aung San Suu Kyi, for example, I think it's very easy for people who are passionate about what they're covering um, to kind of very quickly put a person on um, a very glorified um, place simply because what they are up against. Um, it's not to say that they are not doing great, uh, great work, but there's always a danger of not fully understanding that person um, and what they really represent. Um, that, that's a, it's a very good question, actually. Um, a very good question, because there was a sort of liberal consensus that Aung San Suu Kyi was wonderful. <clears throat> and now I think most of the liberal consensus would say, you know, we were wrong. Uh, and, and interestingly, the people who were very critical of Aung San Suu Kyi uh, were actually not much listened to by, by us in the, you know, consensus liberal media. And we should have been. So I think, I think that's true. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure how this doesn't really directly apply to Hong Kong, but I just think one last point, because it looks like we've, we've, we've run out of time, is that um, th there is a great reliance not just on the local media, which you know, we've discussed how it's, it's disappearing, but on local journalists. And, and most of the people who, who suffer, who get killed uh, and are put in jail for their work tend to be local journalists on whom we, the foreign correspondents, heavily rely everywhere. And of course, you know, recently we had the case of the uh, the Reuters journalists in Myanmar who were thankfully freed. Um, but it's, it's, it's always uh, important to remember that the, a lot of the gritty work of reporting on the ground, whether it's in Latin America or Europe or Africa, is done uh, by local journalists who are incredibly at risk for doing their jobs. And foreign correspondents sometimes in danger, but usually just get expelled. Thank you, Victor. That is, as you say, all we have time to offer. That's fascinating. Quick tour around the world with you. You're going to be here all day, I believe. So if people in this room anyway want to continue the conversation afterwards, they can. But meanwhile, thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, I would like to welcome to the stage my colleague Miranda Johnson, who's going to moderate the next session. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to uh, pan out a little bit, perhaps uh, possibly towards the Asia Pacific, um, to do that and to discuss politics uh, with the sort of next generation and politics and young people. Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage Kun Thanaton, who is the uh, leader of the Future Forward Party in Thailand. And I'd also like to ask Tim Wilson from Australia's House of Representatives to join me. Thank you. Thank you. Wherever you like. Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, I think I'll um, perhaps start with you, Tanaton, if I may, because um, uh, I mean your your party and your movement. Um, it's also been a, a kind of breakneck eighteen months. Um, I'm not sure if people in the room are aware, but uh, in March 2018. Uh, Future Forward sort of first emerged, and then about a year later, uh, in elections in Thailand, it actually became the third largest party. So there was a sort of huge surge in uh, knowledge and awareness and support. And so, in a sense, you're you're also a political disruptor, just uh, one perhaps more inside the system. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if you could tell us uh, perhaps what you learnt along the way, I mean, why you decided to get involved in the messy game of politics and um, whether you still have the kind of optimism that Future Forward can get the things done that it was set up to do? You see, um, over the past five years, since the military junta seized the power in 2014, 
they have cracked down on political oppositions. They have um, taken control of the large swaths of the media. They, the, they suppressed the um, free speech and human rights. They brutally repressed the, they brutally repressed the, the um, um, human rights activists and civic campaigners. The, um, they drafted the new constitution by themselves and for themselves. They wicked the election. So um, back then in 2017, um, my friends and I, we thought that there's no hope left in this country. And somebody has to stand up and do something. Some, somebody has to stand up and confront the military junta. So I decided that if um, there's no political parties out there, existing political parties out there, ready to do this, ready to confront them, ready to challenge them. We have to stand up and do it ourselves. Mm. So that's why we started this political par party. So it's been, the journey has been, what, 18 months long? So it's still very young. Um, we are still imperfect as a political party. There's a lot of things we have to learn. But one thing that is clear, that um, this party is not about just, just about public policies, but I think it's a political project of the people of our generation. You know, in my country, there's been, um, in the past 87 years, since the um, democratic revolution in 1932, there has already been 13 coup d'etats, more than any other, other country in the world. And because of so many coups, um, democratic institutions were not allowed to build strongly. So um, I think that's our mission, that this thing should end within our generation. Coup cool data has to be history in Thailand mm -hmm. so that the people of the next generation could fight their own fight. You know. And it's one thing to be an opposition movement. Mm -hmm. Since Future Forward's uh, members came into uh, the, the lower house in Thailand, mm -hmm. What are the lessons being learned now? It's it's more difficult, perhaps, to try and you know be part of the system than to just oppose it. I think I think it's clear that in order to change, in order to bring down the junta, the regime, you need both movements outside the parliament as well as a voice mm -hmm. inside the parliament. So I think this has to go together. There's no other way you can, you know build the momentum without um, the force outside and the force inside. Mm. Uh, Tim, uh, you have to tell me if this thesis <laughs> sits with you, but do you see yourself as a kind of uh, I I attempt to sort of reinvigorate the policies of your party, the ruling party in Australia, um, sort of from the inside as, as well? I think that's a pretty f fair reflection. I mean, the Liberal Party that I'm a member of was founded 75 years ago and uh, it's gone through different phases and attitudes at any given time, but I think there's a real need in the same way that this conference or this symposium is being organised is to re regenerate the idea of liberal thought and what that means for a society. And particularly because I think we're seeing such a dramatic generational shift that's occurring and you're a part of that uh, and it's across many countries around the world and uh, I have a general view which is that most people sit somewhere between opportunity and security dynamic where they, are, if they're younger, they generally want more opportunity as people age, they want more security and if you actually look at the demographic data in Australia as well as many countries today, uh, there are big bulges at both ends of that demographic, sl demographic slide. So how do you then bridge that divide and how does that play into the politics to be able uh, to build sustainable movements and sustainable change and take the whole country with you? And it's on issues like tax, it's on issues like housing affordability, it's on issues like the environment and climate change, but it's actually about how you have a sustainable country where everybody feels like they're moving forward together. So it's, it's sort of as we were hearing earlier, it's, it's about the details, it's about the nitty gritty. Uh, it is, but um, you can also reinvigorate uh, the ideas within your own political party uh, when the political events present itself. We haven't had to go outside. We've had two um, governments in a row with one-seat majorities. Uh, unsurprisingly, when you've got a one-seat majority and there's one person who's got an issue, you can push for pretty serious change uh, with people. And 
to make it sort of domestically relevant here, uh, a couple of years ago there was a push by our government to ratify an extradition treaty with China uh, and a small number of us from the backbench led uh, a push against the government to do so, including myself, and was obviously able to affect change. That was the sa how Australia legislated uh, marriage for same-sex couples as well. It pushed for change from the backbench rather than being led by the government, and I think that's where uh, there's ripe opportunity. But that's a snapshot in time. Mm. The bigger issues um, transcend a political moment. Of course, and you were a big part of that that fight for same-sex marriage in Australia. Uh, absolutely, and uh, but it was an issue that had reached its time and its moment. Yes. Um, we had to go through a very long and exhaustive process to get there, um, a pub essentially a public vote on the issue. Uh, but it's also about what happens when you push and you just keep pushing regardless of the opposition and the resistance to try and affect change. Mm. At, at Tanner Thorne, do you think that uh, the, sort of the, the moment that Tim refers to, the sort of moment for change, the, the moment has come in Thailand perhaps for the you know, next generation um, that wants to move beyond the old divisions in the country between red and yellow? Well, I think red and yellow, yellow shirt movement that happens over the past decade is a manufactured crisis. I mean, if you look at, you might, if you look at the political crisis in Thailand, the, um, the, the junta, they divide us, they polarize us, they want to um, divide and conquer the people. So it's, it's, it's very important that um, there is a conflict between the people so that they could paint the picture in a way that democracy is the problem, dictatorship the solution. I think that's what they, are, they want to paint, that's what they want people to see. Um, so I think, uh, and those who benefit, ho those who manage to capitalize um, on these conflicts, these um, big capitals, few influential families and individuals that have close connection to the junta, these are the people who, who benefit from this. Mm -hmm. um, in 2018, the Credit Suisse, a bank, released a report on the gap between the rich and the poor. And Thailand has become the worst in the world. The, um, the richest 1% controls about 67% of the country's wealth. 67% of the country's wealth the worst in the world, mm. and it has gone worse since 2016. The same report released third behind Russia and India. Mm. And by 2018, we were the worst. So I think there's a cross link between inequality and the ruling of the junta, mm. you know. So um, we, we, what we are trying to do is that, hey, say, look, the division between the people, you know, the, right, uh, the yellow and the, the red shirt, this division is wrong. The real division is a horizontal division. The people as a whole against the junta. Mm. So that's the, the new picture we're trying to paint. And Tim, obviously inequality and, well, actually intergenerational equity is something that you sort of take to heart and, and, mm. and care about a lot. I mean, could you tell us about your concerns on Australia along these lines? Well, my, my concerns are twofold. Obviously, f the impact that it has on people, but also the impact I think it's having on our democracies overall because uh, there was a good study done a few years ago by the Reason Foundation in the United States which looked at different people's voting behaviour, in particular what led people to vote Republican. And uh, it identified two core themes. One was that people got married and they bought a house, which essentially are investments in the status yeah. quo. And uh, I think when you look at marital rates going out, if you look at housing becoming less affordable, particularly for the next generation, I think you have all the seeds there for uh, an instability at the heart of the democratic system. And you can see it now in a lot of debates in many countries where there's young pitted against the old. And we need to find a way to have a proper discussion about that, but also to address the root underpinnings that sit behind it, tax subsidies and arrangements, preferral or preference, uh, uh, some people, and particularly the established interests against others. And I think the oddity is w when you have those conversations, it takes you to really interesting and exciting liberal places, like shifting taxation behaviour from uh, 
uh, from uh, taxing income towards shifting towards uh, uh, supporting taxation on consumption. And you actually end up in a much more sustainable position economically, but it provides the overarching theory or narrative about why you need to head down that path. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask just one question before I, I open it up to the floor. Um, but both of you, uh, you know, elected uh, representatives, I appreciate Tanaton, you've barely been able to actually, uh, um, you know, go into Parliament, <laughs> uh, yeah. given the legal cases stacking up against you and your party. Um, but you both saw the poll we had at the beginning um, that... Uh, so said that the vast majority of respondents thought that democracy was in decline. Um, uh, Tanatorn, perhaps start with you. Is does that uh, depress you, given how <laughs> hard you're fighting yeah. in your country to try and restore more democratic norms? Just for your information, I think the establishment, the junta, they are, they are, they just um, terrified of the existence of our party because um, our voters are young. So the, um, what they did was they suspend me from entering to the parliament, even though I'm elected from the people. Coming back to your question, I think I am hopeful. I am hopeful. You see, the, um, Thailand is a best case example of what could happen if democracy and human rights are taken for granted. You know, in the 1990s, Thailand was a vibrant democracy. We were an example to hundreds of millions of people in mainland Southeast Asia, you know, in Burma, in Laos, in Cambodia, in v Vietnam, hundreds of millions of people still living um, under authoritarian regimes. So we, we believe that a democratic Thailand could contribute more to the region. Mm. But this is what happened. If you don't stand up and protect democracy and human rights. So I think the that is the mistake and the, the price is high. Mm. We have been in this political conflict for what? 13 years already, 13 years. So the price is very high. And I would like to ask um, all of us, all of you, you know, that the um, you need to protect human rights, no matter um, no matter where it happens. You know, it's about all of us. We need to protect democracy. Otherwise, um, you could end up being like Thailand. Tim, sort of on that point about protecting democracy, what what do you think needs to happen in, in Australia or more broadly? Well, I'm in the minority on this one. I don't think. I don't share the pessimism, but I think what you've seen is those that are uh, dictatorships or governments with a high degree of central control becoming much more assertive. And I think a lot of people in their uh, countries like Australia feel, um, or the United States or others, Western liberal democracies feel like their government isn't necessarily representing them or their concerns. Uh, and I think uh, the only way you're actually going to... I think the, the dictator point is a separate one. When you come into the Western liberal democracies, I think more than anything else, it's um, a consequence of a long drive towards centralisation of power. And I think one of the really important principles that every person who sort of is part of the liberal tradition should advocate very strongly for is a decentralisation of power. We have it where, as I have in the United States, um, uh, increasing amount of power handed over towards uh, the uh, towards the federal government at the expense of the states. But you also, of course, see it in its own way in something like Brexit with a very strong assertiveness yes. to decentralise power from Brussels back uh, to the UK. And the more you advocate for the decentralisation of power, the more you'll have governments that are closest to the people they serve, reflective of the values and with a diversity and competition, which is critically important. Um, uh, but I think you'll have a greater health and socialisation around democracy itself because it will reflect what people want and its ambition. That's fascinating. Um, questions from the floor initially. Does anyone... I know that was a... Can we yes, one at the front here, please. And we'll, I think we'll take two if we've got them. Um, if not, we'll start here. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, Tim, I'd like to know, do you think that Australia is sufficiently using its economic and political power to cause change where it's needed? Take the Thailand example as one, Hong Kong example as another, many other examples. 
huge amount of natural resources are exported that could be chosen not to be exported. Huge economic and cultural change, uh, exchanges take place between Australia and other countries where they don't share the same degree of democracy. Do you think that Australia could handle things differently and do you think there's any change in the wind in how Australia handles these circumstances? I think we're going through a shift actually in perception and attitude uh, around uh, our relationship with our neighbours and particularly around the leverage we have around the economy. Uh, I don't want to announce foreign policy uh, tonight, that's not my job, but uh, I do think you're seeing a re-evaluation of the approach we take, particularly around issues of security and human rights as part of that discussion because in the past we've seen ourselves, I think, as too much of a two-bit player in the region. I think that is... Uh, particularly because of the, at point, retreat and now um, reassertion of the United States. Other countries have come to realise that they can't rely on them uh, to play such a critical role in the region. We've had to build much deeper bonds with countries like uh, Japan and Singapore and others to play that role, and I think you're going to see more of that in a broader scale uh, around working, not necessarily just in isolation, but with other countries uh, to play a critical role in the region and assert some of those important principles. And yes, the economic dimension is going to be part of that, and part of it's actually us building our own confidence. Sort of piggybacking on that question, Tim, um, uh, one of the major concerns I think going forward for future generations will obviously be the state of the climate. Mm. And obviously, when it comes to Australian exports, Australian commodities, coal is you know a, a, a big part of that. Um, you're obviously someone in your party who is sort of speaks up on on climate issues. I wondered how you saw them influencing policy going forward in Australia? Sorry, who... Clim climate, climate concerns. Climate concerns. Well, I think they're omnipresent in a lot of political discussion, though um, uh, I think one of the failures is that too often people have looked at it as a choice between darkness or the candle rather than recognising it's actually about the light globe and about innovation. I think where Australia is going to play a crit critical role is in deploying technology, and most people think of that in terms of things like solar panels, where we can play a really important role is around demand management and reduction in efficiency in the energy usage, and we can actually export those skills and technology around the world. Uh, so I think it's going to play a role in politics, but it's also got to be as part of a discussion where we recognise we can't leave people behind. At the last election, there, were, there was obviously a debate about a big mine, the Carmichael mine, uh, commonly known as the Adani mine in uh, the central part of Queensland and there was environmental groups who went out, who argued against the mine, ran a caravan through those communities. Every single one of them strung very strongly against the environmental groups and uh, the parties that represented their core concerns and so it's got to be a discussion that's about adopting technology, leading discussion but not leaving people behind. Mm. And perhaps for a, a final, very quick question, I could return to you, Quintana Torn. Um, you've spent time in Hong Kong. You mentioned you studied here. I wondered whether you had thoughts on, on the current situation here. And, um, <laughs> you know, y it's interesting that you are leading a movement, and yet this is a leaderless one. Well, actually, what happened in Hong Kong over the past few years also inspires us. Let, let me take you back in 2018 when we when we were trying to make this decision whether to form a party, there was actually two, um, there were two options back then, whether should it be a movement or whether should it be a political party. You know, there was a big debate um, within the founding members of the party. Should we organize it as a political movement or a political party? And we ended up as a political party because, you know, the wound of the 2010 crackdown was still very fresh. In 2010, the military crackdown, there were more, there were more than 100 people um, shot dead, uh, a thousand more wounded because of the crackdown. And we realized that um, they were ready to do anything in their powers you know, to preserve the status quo. So we thought maybe the public is not ready, you know, to have another big movement. Um, um, the fear still inside the hearts and the minds of the people. So we said, okay, then if we cannot do it as a movement, then the only alternative left is the political party. So I think, in a way, um, Hong Kong um, inspires us. Mm. 
That's a wonderful note to end on. Um, please thank uh, my panellists with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, next, I'd like to uh, welcome onto the stage Victoria Walvis, who of the Peel Street Poets, who's going to read one of her pieces for us. Thanks so much. This is a poem about empathy and um, compassion, and it's called uh, Lacrimator. Neighbor, should I love you as I love myself, I'd hate you. I'd reach into your voice and pull your heart and nerve and sinew. I'd show them to the bleating crowd, become you, become the crowd, become the angry scab of sun, forget my head, my soul, and run. If conscience makes us cowards, I'd rather be a coward than a rat in the burning house or the man with a match in his hand. If we share nothing, let us share this, our cowardice, our fear, our pissing into the wind. When the smoke clears, I see my sister's face. I didn't know she was here. In Latin, lacrima means tears. Love is what we do in spite of ourselves, hating ourselves, hating and loving each other. My sister, my brother, the person whose face I can't see, who bears me no grudges, whose indignity I have never probed with naked fingers. Neighbor, should I love you as I love myself? I'd hate you. I really hate it when he clips his nails on public buses. He hates the way I rest my foot on my knee, exposing the scum on my soul. There's love on the hand rest, if only we'd touch it. Let me let you reach into my voice. Let us hold hands on a stage in the marketplace of hate. Let us stare at hate into love's frightened eyes, brimming with mace. Who do I fear but myself with an alien face? In Latin, lacrima means tears. Let us weep then. And I'd like now, thank you so much indeed, Victoria. I'd like um, now to introduce, um, uh, forgive me, Sudhir Vedeket. It's you, Sudhir, there you are, <laughs> who is going to talk about identity in, in, uh, in Asia. Thanks, Dominic. Thanks, Sudhir. That's my maternal grandma. Nani just turned 90, or maybe 91. Family debates the exact year, as we do everything. <laughs> Last time I saw her in May, she told me the same three things. Lovely to see you. When are you finally going to have kids? And would you please learn some Hindi so we can communicate better? I don't speak any Indian language. My maternal ancestors are from Rajasthan, in the far north of India. My paternal are from Kerala in the far south, and I was born in Singapore, middle of Southeast Asia. So yes, utterly confused. The only other languages I speak are Malay and Singlish, which is our delightful local Creole in Singapore. Today I have a dilemma about Hindi. On the one hand, I want to learn it so I can communicate with Nani while she's around. On the other hand, given India's nationalist push, given Modi's Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan agenda, I'm not sure I want to contribute to that in even the smallest way. What defines your identity? This actually is the question of my talk. In a short 
answer would be everything, from your parents to your food choices, to the kind of music you listen to, whether K-pop or Taylor Swift. But what role does the state play? How does government define your identity? In some places, it's a much more concerted, top-down effort, and in others, a much more laissez-faire, hands-off approach. And I think, in order for us to understand nationalism, populism, xenophobia, and all these other forces in our world today, we have to really understand how the state defines identity. And I want to tell this story partly through China and India, the subject of my next book. This is a lady I met in Manipur. Manipur is a lovely state in the far northeast of India. It borders Myanmar. It's actually physically closer to Hainan than it is to Delhi. The Manipuris have their own language and animistic religion, but over the past couple of centuries, they've slowly moved closer to the Indian heartland. Many of them speak Hindi today, many of them are Hindus, and they also make one of the best dals, lentil curries, that I've ever had. Don't tell my nani that. She won't be very pleased. It's, it's a bit like telling your Texan grandma that the best apple pie comes from Puerto Rico. <laughs> so language and religion are two ways that India defines identity. Caste matters, but in different ways and to a lesser degree. Now, what that means, of course, is that a person of any color could, in theory, become part of the majority. An Italian immigrant like Sonia Gandhi, who learns Hindi and embraces Hinduism, can become Indian. Any of you could, in theory, become Indian. Now, not everybody in India agrees with this notion, and of course, there is still discrimination based on skin color and looks, just like in China, the fairer the better. But my point is that there's nothing immutable about the Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan agenda that Modi is promoting. That also means, of course, that people can leave the majority group. Some of my Manipuri friends say that the Manipuris should stop speaking Hindi, they should stop practicing Hinduism, and they should even stop eating dal, because dal itself is an introduction from the Indians. So identity in India is based on very fungible characteristics. They are changeable. In China, it's a completely different story. These Tibetan kids who I met near Shigatse, they will never actually become part of the Han majority. China has a very formalized ethnic identity structure with 56 different groups. The Han majority, of course, makes up more than 90%. The Han itself is the product of an assimilation over many centuries, including everybody from the Cantonese to the people of northern China. It's the same thing with the Tibetans. Tibetans of different regions and different dialects were kind of coalesced around one Tibetan identity. In the 1950s, some 400 potential ethnic groups got whittled down to the 56 that we see in China today. And of course, the state tries to redefine identity whenever it can. So we have the Uyghur Muslim identity slowly being pushed towards the Hui Muslim identity, a more palatable form of Islam for China. This is the state telling you who you are. And this is reinforced every day on your identity card, through the forms you fill up, through family planning regulations. Many minority groups in China, for example, never had to follow the one-child policy. So these two models that I've presented, the top-down and the bottom-up, they're obviously not binaries, they're not extremes, they're sort of general approaches on a spectrum. And for their own reasons, they're feeling pressure to become a bit more like each other. And I want to tell the next story through my country, Singapore. In Singapore, we have a very similar top-down model. Every citizen gets bucketed into one of these four categories, CMIO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, others. To this very day, I have Chinese Singaporeans coming up to me and saying, Hey, you Indian? Ah? Sure or not? How come your skin not black one? <laughs> For those who don't understand Singlish, essentially a lot of Singaporeans cannot understand how I can be Indian because I don't fit into that neat, idealized ethnic stereotype that they've been <laughs> sold their whole lives with the darker skin and the curly hair and the mark on the forehead. Top-down models can be very reductive. They force people into these identity straitjackets where you're forced to conform. Think about the Tibetan kids that I just showed you. They were born in China, 
they have to subscribe to this idealized Tibetan norm. If they were just born across the border in India, they would be much freer to choose who they wanted to be. They could perhaps learn Hindi, embrace Hinduism, maybe slowly assimilate with the majority. If they were born in Singapore, they would be neither Chinese nor Indian, but they would be others. Let me next talk about our president, Halima Yaakob. In 2017, the Singapore government reserved the presidential election just for Malays. And after doing that, they then decided that there was only one Malay in the whole of Singapore fit to run for president. So she won in a walkover. <laughs> now, she's a lovely person and a great president by all accounts, but I think a lot of Singaporeans were irritated by the process that actually got her into office. And I want to focus on the racial dimension. Now, a few months before she entered office, it was actually discovered that Halima's official race on her identity card is Indian because of her Indian Muslim father. Now, she had been accepted into the Malay community a long time before that, so she was eligible to run as a Malay. But what happened is that her supporters, in order to prove how Malay she is, they started to airbrush her Indian identity out of the public eye. They went onto Wikipedia and tried to remove her dad's Indian ancestry. These are the kind of silly racial identity complications you get into when you have this top-down manufactured system. Is Halima actually ashamed of her Indian ancestry? I'm sure the answer is no, but she was also forced to go through all this. Why then, you might be asking, do countries even use such a top-down system? Well, the usual answer is it makes for better administration in a nation-state where you have different ethnicities. Many people believe that it is actually the best way to protect minorities. It is actually the best way to fight racism. Because what's the alternative? If you don't want to define race, if you tell the state not to measure race, perhaps what you're implying is that there is no such thing as racism. And that's why you're getting a push even from the other end. One of the most laissez-faire countries in the world when it comes to race, Portugal. You know, in, in Portugal, race is really a four-letter word. But even in Portugal, they are now feeling the pressure to start to consider racial questions in their census for this very reason. So it will allow them to actually define and fight racism better. I want to finish off with three big things. One is think about how governments shape your identity. Some use a much more top-down approach, and others are much more bottom-up. Um, and you need to think about how those forces affect the way you live your life every day. Second, think about how those models are becoming closer. There are many liberals out there who still believe that every human can actually live on different platforms of cultural identity. What I mean is I should be comfortable being an Indian, being a Singaporean, being a Southeast Asian, being an Asian, and being a human. And I should every day be able to code switch between these identities and move seamlessly. Now, I'm not sure everybody wants to actually live like that. So I think one of the big challenges of our time is actually how do we design political systems that can accommodate different people who want to exist on different rungs of that identity ladder. And third, Finally, I think we all have to think more closely about our identity choices. What if I learn Hindi? What if I sign up for a Hindi course in Singapore and sign into the Facebook page of that center? Will somebody see that and somebody judge me? What if I go to India and I start speaking Hindi to my nani? What will the people around us think? Will they start thinking, oh, this half-breed, he's now learning Hindi. He's one step closer to this Hindi, Hindu, Hindustani ideal of Modi, our hero. So I think in all our actions, we have to start thinking much more closely about identity and what we do. I would like to leave you by saying terima kasih. Terima kasih means thank you in Malay. Uh, I say it because my Malayan identity is one that I'm very proud of, but also because terima kasih has a beautiful meaning. Literally, it means accept my love. So for your time and patience today, terima kasih. Uh, th thank you so much, Sudhi, and we look forward to the next book. And for those of you who haven't, I can I really recommend his last one, Floating on a Malayan Breeze. 
Um, I'm Simon Long, in case you've forgotten. I'm here to uh, uh, moderate a panel on India, uh, which is seen as one of democracy's great success stories. But as Sudhir was alluding to just now, um, it's a place where democracy is seen as under some strain at the moment. And to uh, unpick what's going on, I'm lucky to be joined by two people. Nihad Dixit, who's one of uh, India's leading independent journalists. Please, Nihad. And Abin Singh, who's the founder and coordinator of the National Association for Street Vendors of India. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Abin. Um, I mean, it is a remarkable story of democracy, India, if you think about it. 72 years as an independent country, for much of that period, a very poor independent country. And but for a brief interlude in the 1970s, has remained solidly democratic throughout it. Solidly democratic in the sense of having a very robust adversarial politics, uh, elections by and large see seen as free and fair, but also strong institutions, uh, notably a very uh, independent and indeed activist judiciary, a uh, outspoken free press, uh, and a vibrant and lively civil society, all able to keep some sort of check on abuses of power and executive privilege. Um, so I'd like to start, we have representatives of two of those <laughs> different sorts of institutions, and I'd like to start, if I may, Niha, with the, with, with the press. Uh, I mean, how, uh, how, how well do you think the press is, 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 is faring in um, Modi's India, as Sudhir referred to it? Uh. Okay. First of all, thank you. And I think uh, this is a good uh, point to bring this in because what Sudhi just talked about, the idea of identity and Hindu, hin Hindi, Hindustan. Uh, what has currently happened is that uh, it's I in the last five years, so which is the last five years of the Modi government, there have been several attacks on the press. But there is something that which is deeper which needs to be looked at, which is that in the last, say, last decade, uh, there is a difference between a state-controlled media, but what we have in India is mainstream media completely controlled by a corporate political nexus. So which means that uh, one, so, so one part is that one third of the cable distribution in India is owned by politicians. And then the other part is that most corporate houses have in invested in mainstream media. It's the same corporate houses that also give political funding to these political parties in power. So which has created a nexus which is not just self-censorship or censorship, but also escalated to a point of propaganda. So which is why if we see across newsrooms that uh, it's very, uh, very few news organizations want to put out a piece of investigative reporting or forget investigative reporting, even a piece of ground report. So that is one change, and which is why we see, we were talking about post-truth world, and which is why we see, even in Indian media, there is a sea of opinion journalism that happens, which is easy to dismiss, where, where you criticize somebody and you just dismiss it by saying, oh, this is this person's opinion, but there is no scope to put out a story which is based on facts and evidence and documentation. Perhaps, you, uh, I mean, perhaps we should get a bit more personal. Yeah. Neha is, is a winner of a International Press Freedom Award this year from the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is not something that tends to be given to journalists who write mainly about their own country and countries with a free press. Uh, and uh, I believe you are here because you are out on bail, right? I mean, you, you are, uh, um, could you des describe what, what has happened to you? Uh, Okay, so I want to start with this, that this is not, not just me, but several journalists in India are facing this. But uh, in uh, the story that got me in this situation, let me just talk about that. In 2016, I had done a story, a long-form investigative story uh, over four months, where the place that Sudhir was showing, Manipur, this is another state called Assam, in the northeast of India, where I found out uh, how... 31 tribal girls from Assam were trafficked by Hindu nationalist organizations, uh, particularly called RSS in India, Rashtra Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is also related to the current ruling party in India, which is BJP. So these, these Hindu fundamentalist groups had trafficked 31 tribal girls between the age group of 3 to 11 to 
another part of India, which is Punjab and Gujarat. And once the children were taken away on the pretext of being given free education, and these girls were really from remote parts, really remote parts, and from extremely socio-economically marginalized families. So once the girls were taken away, the parents just couldn't get in touch with their daughters. And all the documentation, all the photographs were also taken away. And these are such remote parts that once you take away the photographs, there's no way the parents can prove that they even had these daughters. So uh, I found out, I met the parents, and then I found out document, government documentation from the statutory bodies saying that this is child trafficking and the girls should be sent back. So I accessed those documents by the uh, Commission for Protection of Child Rights and various other government bodies. And then I traced those girls in Punjab and Gujarat where these three, four, five-year-old girls had been trained there. So they, are, they, are, they were traditionally from the Bodo tribe. Now they don't even know how to converse in Bodo any longer. Now they can only speak in Hindi. So so which means whenever they meet their parents back, they will not be able to have any conversation with them. The girls were also being trained uh, in creating a Hindu country, which means that they was the, the things that they were saying were completely Islamophobic. They were being trained into fighting the Christian and the Muslim invaders. So, so is it an important, true story that you're yes. able to substantiate. Yeah, so to just cutting the long story short and when, so then while I was meeting the girls, the, the people, the Hindu fundamentalist groups, they like locked me up inside the compound and because I'm an independent journalist for the last seven years, I don't have a press card. So it's just very difficult to prove that I'm a journalist. So then eventually I got out, but once the story was published, uh, there were two criminal cases filed against me and this is also a pattern now in India. So we also have an archaic law which is criminal defamation, so you can be imprisoned if it's proven that you've defamed somebody. So that is a standard charge that is used against journalists and which was used earlier also before Modi government. But the new pattern is they also uh, uh, add another uh, law in order charge. So the other charge against me is inciting communal hatred, which is a serious uh, charge which could get me imprisoned for seven years. So it's been three years now. And the case is 2,000 kilometers from where I live. So every second month I have to go. The organization that I published the story for is not supporting me. And this is again a pattern again in India that most of the time when journalists face these cases, they're pretty much left to themselves to battle them. So that was the situation that, so now, yeah, I'm here. And <laughs> Th thanks for saying. I mean, if I, if I could turn to you, I mean, again, from the outside, this looks like a, a, a sort of one of the strengths of, of Indian democracy here, run this organization representing s some pretty vulnerable people in society, street traders who in, in many countries have, a, have a, a rough time. Could you just tell us a bit about NASFI and, and about uh, the, how, how successful you feel you're being? Oh, we, in India, we have like 10 million street vendors and... Uh, uh, as India started globalizing, urbanization increased, and uh, from being a rural country, a lot of focus on cities, and so the atrocities, harassment on street vendors also increased. They were, the uh, municipal administration was trying to push them out. So we got together and started organizing them, and a good part of Indian democracy is definitely you can organize and organize legally. and. Uh, so we be began organizing them and we, in that process, uh, we got a policy in 2004. We soon realized that in a federal country, uh, uh, implementing the policies are a little difficult. So we started asking for a law and uh, based on the good experiences of implementing the policy, some of the best practices, we got incorporated and we got a very good law in 2014. And the law is the first of the kind in, it, in the world, and it uh, it is very it is path breaking, and it says that you cannot evict a street vendor until uh, you have done the survey and given the given the street vendor certificate of vending. And, and suppose a street vendor contacts you saying, "I am being evicted despite this law. 
can you can you successfully yes, intervene? Yes, and we went to courts after this law first happened in Delhi itself in front of the famous Jama Masjid area, and we went to the because we got a clause inserted in the act that until that 3.3 that until that person is surveyed and provided a certificate of vending, you can't. And the court, the high court, Delhi High Court got them stay go, that uh, and they are still there. The the vendors are there. So, uh, so this uh, this act uh, we have uh, we have gone to courts many a times, and there is a very interesting clause in this act. It is called the town vending committee. So, as part of the town vending committee, fifty percent of the representatives are street vendors, and none no country in the world has this kind of uh, multi partite body. And until the Town Vending Committee recommends about street vending, the Municipal Corporation cannot take a decision about street vendors. So that Town Vending Committee enables their participation and it is first of the kind because it enables them to decide their destiny. Where will the vending zone be? How will the city vending plan? To whom should the uh, Municipal Corporation give uh, uh, the certificates of vending? So what we realized, I mean, and that, that is what I tell people, is that if we want to get something in a functioning democracy like India, you know, you have to learn to hit below the belt. You know? <laughs> so the, uh, yeah, and what the best method we started was, we, so because we couldn't be everywhere, so we started building this community organization and helping them to yeah. get registered. And the best way to catch, uh, impact the policy or impact government is to through the members of parliament. Sure. So we have street vendors all across. And so if, we, if the minister is from, say, Rai Bareilly, for example, the present labor minister is from Bareilly. So we get the Bareilly vendors to influence the government, you know. Yeah. And that has been very successful. So, so that's one way in which uh, sort of grassroots politics can translate into, into high politics. But can we look at a, a big issue at the moment that sort of seems to have gone the other way in the sense that top down, and I'm thinking of Kashmir, um, very sort of strange uh, way of getting around having to amend the constitution to place Kashmir or to bifurcate it and place it under direct rule from from from, from Delhi, stayed on lockdown for what two months now. Days. I, mean, I mean, how? Um, yeah, and what, what does that say about about the state of Indian democracy and also about the fact that the, the, the state of the those proud institutions like the judiciary that I mentioned at the beginning? Uh, absolutely, this is the. I think this is the time to understand that if we call, if this is the world's lar largest democracy, is does this demo is this democracy only for people from third certain privileged parts, certain kind of people, or or, or or everybody? Because in Kashmir, it's the today is the 62nd day where the communication blockade continues. There we we know people. These are over 10 million people who have not been able to get in touch with their families, no phone calls, no internet for the longest time. Indian journalists most of the time have not been able to go out there or report, or even if they've managed to report, the Indian publications haven't published those round reports. So this is a major problem that we are, we are dealing with, and these are millions. So it just, the only reportage that has come out is from international publications. So that is a major problem. And what has happened in Modi's India is that indifference has become a virtue. So which is why other people in other part of the country are completely going about their business. And it does not matter that over 10 million people are facing this kind of blockade. And, and you, you, have in the, you have members in Kashmir. Are you yeah, able to do anything for them? Yeah, we have members in Kashmir, and we have been intervening in Kashmir. But uh, unfortunately, we just had our national convention in Bangalore. There's just one person could somehow come to Bang to attend the convention. So, uh, see what whenever such situation happens, the most vulnerable population face the worst. You know, they they suffer the maximum. So, the street vendors also have suffered because of the uh, because of this blockade. Okay. I'd like to um, see if there are any questions in the from the from the floor, if I if I, if I may. I see that, that I'm sure that clock is going fast. It is running down very, very fast. So one here, is it? Yeah, in the front of Fix it. Thank you. Both of you have made uh, reference to the, the power of the party, BJP, but also you've made reference to the power of the corporate. And while you have made changes to the law that allows the street vendors to have an input on the regulation, 
Currently, the corporate is so strong in India and getting stronger with e-tailing that if the corporate wants to squash the street vendors, they can do it through the power of economics by cutting prices, by having promotions, by using the power of their wallet. How can democracy address this? Because they are operating in a free economy and they are operating fully within the law in a country where we need to find a, a balance between large corporates who are trying to increase the commercial situation of Indian, common Indians and the members on the street who are also trying to make a living. I'll give you two examples. One is that when we were getting the Street Vending Act, we knew that the market is opening up and the corporates will come into this space. You know? So we put this clause that until the person is surveyed, you know, so that you need to get a street vending license, you need to be there on the street. And you should be, when the municipal corporation surveys you, you should be there on the street. Believe me, ev almost every week I get a mail that we want to do business on the street. We are a large corporate. We want to sell ice cream on the cream. We want to sell this on the, on the street. I, I get, uh, particularly among the food vendors, there are also now clothing companies. They want to sell through the street vendors. But you cannot, be, you cannot hire people on the street. You have to be actually a street vendor. So the act protects the person who's there on the street. That is one, re one example. Second is, and that's why I want to focus on organizing. If you are, a, if you are, the organization is strong, vibrant, is able to think in, about future, then you can negotiate yourself properly. So when the, India had the food safety law in 2011, the law was implemented. And everybody said that this law is to basically drive away the small food entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. you know. So the pizza huts and McDonald's will come and then they will drive away. So what we did was, that we took it head on. We started organizing street food festivals. And believe me, the food, one street food festival, we have 60,000 people attending. And it's a ticketed event. Earlier we did only in Delhi, now we are doing all over. And we proved that street food is much more attractive than Pizza Hut. <laughs> yeah. and, and people, and the, when the vendors, when the vendors, we train them, and when the vendors, start, vendors realize that they can get five times the price of what they got on the street, merely because the presentation and hygiene improved, so they began them offering, they themselves began registering under the Food Safety Act, you know. So organizing, organizing particularly when there is an opportunity, changes, and you also have to fight with the mindset, and there are, so the corporate thing is definitely there, the fear is there, but uh, we, we, ha we have not allowed the FDI in retail till now. You know, we have registered and we have been, we have been successful till now that in, in multi-retail only there. In India, it's only allowed in single retail. In multi-product retail, it's still, it's still not there. But at the same time, you know, not only getting the space, not, you want, our members have to be prepared that market is important. If the market goes out of hand, then everything. I think, I think Neha wanted to say. I also want to get back to what I said about corporate political nexus. I think there has to be a clear more transparency when it comes to political funding because what is happening is that this kind of nexus has created crony capitalism, which means that only certain big uh, corporate houses are favored instead of the small and medium ones. So which is why, like Tim was ta talking about Adani's, there are certain corporate houses which are favored and uh, that needs to stop which is why recently, if, you, if you've if you noticed, that we had things like demonetization in India, which only affected the smaller players and not the bigger ones. So that has to be uh, dealt with more institutionally rather than just you know some smaller approaches, I think. Um, we've got very little time left, but I did want to come back to the theme of Sudhir's mm -hmm. talk, because mm -hmm. India has had very complex identity politics mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. longer than anyone. We've had parties based on region, caste, language, yes. and, and so on. Is that problem getting worse, and 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 what does it mean for for 
for democratic principles? Just very briefly, if I could have from yeah. both of you to close up. Uh, I think w the current challenge right now is that in India, uh, the most privileged people right now who are framing things and in this, because we've become, like religion has become very political right now, especially the Hindutva ideology, which is the ideology uh, practiced by the current political party. Uh, the upper caste Hindu North Indian male is the person who is deciding all things and which is why marginalization of tribals, marginalization of Dalits who are in the lower rung of the caste system and untouchability and things, other things have been practiced against them for the longest time are minorities, the Muslims, the Christians, all of them are outside this realm of this ideology which the current government is practicing and which is why it's all the more important to address these things even in the Indian media. We do not have enough Dalit journalists, enough other people and otherwise politically also, which is why we see lynchings, we have seen mob lynchings, so many people being lynched on the road on the accusation of uh, consuming beef or other stuff. I think it, it, it's become more in the foreground and it needs to be dealt with. Thank you yeah. very much. Would you, would you do you want to add it in 10 seconds? We're already over time, I think. Yeah, there has been uh, threats and also in terms of hatred, particularly region-wise. Uh, and also, you know, if the, if the local government is of a particular religion, then the, the, the mayors are, mayor is of a particular religion, then the vendors are of a different religion. So those kind of incidents have definitely increased, but I still believe that organizing is the key and is the powerhouse. Abin, thank you very much. Can I thank both my panelists very much for <laughs> insightful addresses? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it uh, only remains for me to hand over to uh, David Rennie, our Beijing Bureau Chief and Chagwan columnist. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd just like to ask the other panellists to come up on stage. So we have uh, Daniel Fung uh, from the Cambridge Global Conversations, and we have Brian Fong, I hope, from the Education University of Hong Kong, and my colleague Rosie Bloor, uh, who is now the editor of 1843. So can I put you there? Sure. And Professor, can I put you there? And I'm going to put Rosie at the end, so we have a kind of economist bookend effect, if that works. But Rosie was also our Beijing correspondent at all. 2017. So I'm very glad that the question for this session has been phrased in the way that it has, sort of trying to understand and, and unpick China's ambitions, uh, because I think very often we kind of talk about what the world is going to do about China and to China. But here we are in Hong Kong, in Asia, and I think it's a tremendous opportunity to also try and understand how the world looks from China. So really, I mean, so the question that we've been asked, our sort of exam question, is understanding China's ambitions in Asia and the world. And I'd like to ask whether you think that word ambitions means the same outside as it does inside. Because one of my experiences in Beijing, talking to Chinese officials, is I suspect some of them would actually sort of bridle and object to the idea that China has ambitions which have changed to become more frightening. It's more that China is a country with rights, and it has a responsibility to become prosperous and to help its people rise, and it has sovereignty to protect. But the idea that the world is frightened of China because China's ambitions are suddenly more scary, I think plenty of people in Beijing would, would reject that basic premise at all. So let's start with that question about whether, you know, so the classic example is you, you go to Washington, people say, you know, Deng Xiaoping's famous statements about China will never seek hegemony or Deng Xiaoping's statement about China will bide its time and hide its kind of strength. So the classic accusation, I think, is that if the world is more frightened of China right now in Asia and in the whole world, it's because China has somehow shown its hand and has frightening ambitions, maybe even to be a hegemon. So let's ask the panel whether you think, how does that sort of seem from China and here in the region? Can I start with you? Uh, sure. I, I, I think Lucien Pai got it dead right when he said that um, China is really a civilization masquerading as a nation state because it's never thought of itself as a nation state. It, it, what, it never developed under Westphalian system. Westphalia is clearly, you know, 1648, a European um, invention. And it so happened that uh, we've, we've lived through almost 400 years of Westphalia. It's coming to an end. We know that. The shelf life has expired. But China never went through 
uh, that sort of process. And, and, and therefore, I think, you, uh, David, you, you got it dead right, that uh, China doesn't see itself um, as a nation competing against others, and therefore it needs to dominate, or it needs space, or it needs to assert uh, hegemony over a particular region. Um, it, it basically is, a, and it, it has reemerged, I suppose, uh, as that uh, civilization. We look at um, ancient maps uh, of China, um, assuming they were even allowed to draw um, and identify countries outside the central kingdom. Um, they don't actually exist. In, in fact, all under heaven uh, means civilization. All under heaven means uh, we, we are uh, what we are. Well, just before I turn to the others, though, isn't that quite frightening, potentially, that if China doesn't think of itself as a nation state in the same sort of delimited sort of lines on a map that, that gave birth to other nation states. If China thinks of itself as a civilization, what does that mean about, say, Chinese in Australia or Chinese students in Canada having a kind of argument on campus? Does that mean that actually China's critics might be right when they say that someone tremendously ambitious like President Xi Jinping thinks that he's actually the leader of all Chinese everywhere in the world, that if they're children of the Yellow Emperor, that somehow they belong to him, that Tian Xia, all under heaven, is, is, is a phrase you hear in Congress now as a kind of proof of China's sort of terrifying global ambitions. Just before I, I we go to the others, how, what would you respond to that kind of charge? I, I think the discombobulation uh, arises be because of that history and culture, but we know that since the Bandung Declaration of 55, that that has been disabused of, and, and therefore the idea that... Um, and Including the non-aligned movement. Well, they, they have to choose, right? So um, John Lyon, I think, uh, made it very plain in 55, and I think that's still the position today, that you have to choose. You, you either become a citizen of Australia, or, or you come home, right? And a lot of people in Indonesia came home back in the late 50s because of the pogroms. Brian Fong, let me turn to you. You've yep. written very eloquently about sort of China's sort of the perception of China, particularly in, in the West. How do you respond to? to uh, for me, as a scholar, we like to put things in a in a framework. I I think we we, we can uh, interpret uh, the the China influence phenomenon as a struggle between the democratic capitalism of the free world and the authoritarian capitalism of China. Here we need to go back to to 1990s when U.S. attempt uh, to adopt a so-called economic engagement policy, trying to push forward China liberalizations through uh, uh, by integrating China into the U.S.-led capitalist uh, um, uh, democratic system. Uh, the best uh, uh, President Bill Clinton best capture uh, the mindset. Well, in 2000, when he supported China's section to, to WTO, he said that uh, bringing China into the uh, World Trade Organization uh, may not guarantee that China will choose political reform, but the change of economic force will confront China to make choice sooner. That's the exactly the, the, the arguments that uh, the U.S. government, uh, behind the U.S. government decisions to grant China uh, WTO, to sub, uh, 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 MFN to support China, a section of WTO, and also have uh, lots of economic partnership with China. But the problem is it doesn't happen. Uh, as rightly pointed out by economists, it's, it's in this, uh, uh, last year in a famous uh, uh, cover story, the rest got China wrong. China never thought about integrating with the uh, uh, democratic capitalism. They always thought about how, on the one hand, preserve its authoritarian government, but on the other hand, make use of market force to strengthen the economy. So that is the, the case. So you've made two very interesting points there, and I want to make sure we don't kind of miss them. So let's separate them out. I think point one is you would say that one of the reasons the world is perhaps more anxious about China is that China sees a Chinese model and it's an authoritarian model, and yep. perhaps it would like to see that spread, or it might wish to export it. So let's explore that yep. in a minute. But you, you also make the point about the West's disappointment, that perhaps there were some in the West who believed that China's economic integration into the global kind of world of capitalism should lead like a kind of virus yep. into China becoming more like the West. Now, there's actually a fascinating debate at the moment among veterans of the Bill Clinton White House and... and and, and that kind of government, that well, we never really meant it. <laughs> you know, there's some amazingly interesting articles appearing at the moment about, well, we, yes, of course, we said that that might make them democratic, but that was just because to get it through Congress. But you know, we were never that naive. 
So the idea of being perceived as naive seems to be more shocking than being incredibly cynical, which some might <laughs> would say should also embarrass them, but you know, let's move on. So let's unpack that. Before we turn to the idea, which is very important, about whether China has a model that it wants to export, let's look at that question of the West's disappointment that China didn't take that more kind of liberal path. Rosie, you left Beijing in 2017. You wrote some wonderful stories for us there, not just about sort of politics, but also about the kind of the cultural issues uh, to do with things like sort of sexual politics and, and, and gender. When you looked at those issues, which really touched on things like China's willingness to become more liberal, China's willingness to tolerate sort of more diversity of views. During your time in Beijing, do you think that you sensed that actually China was taking some sort of decisions that did lead it down less liberal paths? Is that, you know, if we're disappointed that China isn't more liberal and more democratic, is that just because we were stupid or cynical back in 2001? Or has China actually changed? Did you see China changing? Um, I think we were both stupid and China has changed. Um, I think the thing that is so interesting when you look at what happens, um, what China does within the country and outside, is that the government is absolutely brilliant at doing things in such small steps that no single one appears to be overstepping or being so egregious that someone takes an action. Just take the South China Sea. Everything that's been done there is so small at a time that it never is such a provocative act that someone goes, right, now we're going to do something. But suddenly you look around and the world has changed. The South China Sea is now South China. The same could be said, um, as we, we might gradually see, um, potentially, of, of China's Belt and Road. And if you look at China's actions within and without, the mistake that I think those, those looking from outside um, have made is that they expect to see a sudden moment where China's ambitions are evident, you know, are, are, are very clear. And instead, what they're failing to do is looking at what those small increments lead to. I think there's been a huge change in the ambitions. I also think they've got much better at articulating them. Daniel Fung, can I ask you, do, do you think China thinks it has a Chinese model that others should embrace? And is that a kind of essentially an authoritarian model that China thinks has been jolly successful in China? So time to start exporting that, just like we export jolly clever smartphones. I, I think that the case can be quite compellingly made to the contrary, that um, chi China has never actually seen uh, its particular development path as being replicable um, in, in most other countries or any, any other country. I mean, it's always emphasized that it's a fairly unique path. So does that mean that, for example, Belt and Road has no kind of normative ambitions hidden within it? So it's purely about lending money so people can build kind of hydroelectric dams? No. I, I, I think the, the, the Belt and Road model is, is, is more similar to the um, East India, India Company models mm. of both the Netherlands uh, and, 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 and the UK, right? Because, or Great Britain, as it, as it that then was the idea that um, empire follows trade and, and, and so on and so forth. But I, I don't think one, one need to articulate it like that, and, and nor, nor is that uh, an inevitable uh, denouement at all. Um, right now, it's about expor exporting excess capacity, and it's about um, replacing markets. Now, whether or not it goes down to an e East India company model, I very much doubt, because history doesn't repeat itself. It may rhyme, but it doesn't really repeat itself. Just uh, because our time is limited, it's a, you know, all these panels are quite tight. Before we turn to America and, and the relations with the West, let's just make sure we don't forget Asia. Rosie raised the South China Sea. Staying with the Belt and Road for a moment, we have seen sort of, not consistently, but we've seen moments of, sort of spasms of pushback, have we not? You know, Malaysia, uh, in Indonesia, even you know, some of the, you know, Australia, we have our friend here from Australia, getting very anxious about specific parts of the Belt and Road. Do you see... Um, professor, a kind of normative ambition hidden within Belt and Road, or is it just about sur ex exporting surplus production capacity? I, I will interpret the, the, the existing uh, dynamics in, in a so-called free concentric rings. I think Hong Kong is the first layer that facing China expanding influence uh, as a peripheral autonomy. And then the second layer is Taiwan, which is a de facto sovereign state, also come under stronger and stronger China influence. And the third layer, uh, and the third wing, is, is the other Indo-Pacific states, such as Australia and New Zealand. So we, in all these three wings, we can see how there are counter-China influence mobilizations over the past few years. 
Let's just before we see if there are questions, um, I want to ask about the US-China relationship, but not by asking about Donald Trump, because I think we spend enough time talking and thinking about Donald Trump. We can <laughs> give him a break <laughs> for the next seven minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> instead, so I'll quote something a, a very clever Chinese official said to me that reminded me almost of kind of someone talking about a bad marriage. I was asking about, you know, America's growing concern about China. And he said, you know, the problem with the Americans is you always think it's about you. You know, why do you imagine it's about you? China is rising. China, you know, this idea that China is trying to overtake America to become the largest economy in the world. He said, we're just trying to get richer because that would be good for China. Why do Americans always think it's about overtaking America or trying to become the hegemon? Is that completely 100% believable? Or is that just a bit disingenuous that actually it is somewhat about overtaking America or at least making the world safe for the Chinese autoc autocratic kind of system and that means pushing America back a bit ideally kind of past Hawaii well I I, I, I think the the two are not mutually exclusive right be, 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 because um, I, I think China is extremely egocentric but it's history and culture and the fact that it survived 5,000 years uh, is um, I think testimony to that um, uh, survive, survivability and also to the egocentrism. And, and, and th therefore, um, I, I suppose you could flip it the other way around. For China, is always about China, right? Um, and I, I think there's some truth to that. So China doesn't think of itself as, as, as it were, you know, grabbing space from other people, et cetera, but more about its own um, integrity, survival, et cetera. Professor, is this zero sum? Does, if China's rise is to continue, does that involve in some way America being pushed back at least so that America can't stop that rise? How, how zero is some I, I would see the things in this way because um, I, I think over the past few decades from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping, uh, China, what China has not changed is this authoritarian capitalism. But what has been changed since 2012 is that Xi Jinping has basically ad abandoned uh, you know, the, the, the previous, the, the so-called hiding capability policy and becomes more active in exporting China influence outside China. Uh, for example, the Confucian Institutes, uh, it, it, it made basically a direct clash between China values, the China model, and the Western model in different places around the world. So I think that is the, the, the challenge that all the peoples in the free world, including the people in Hong Kong, must face. This is a tremendously interesting point you've raised, just Paul. I'm very keen to, if you have questions, do let me know so we don't miss you before the kind of clock runs out. Let's turn to that question of influence, Rosie. And you know, we're seeing all of these extraordinary confrontations on campuses and in kind of diaspora communities, you know, involving things you know, the, the parade of Ferraris and Jaguars with Chinese flags in the name of communism we saw the other day um, in Canada. You know, amazing stuff. Um, do you think that this is all kind of being planned in some sort of Bond villain's lair somewhere in China that all of these things are happening? Or is this just a natural expression of patriotism and, and sincere kind of pride in country that is manifesting itself because there's lots of Chinese overseas. Do you think there is a kind of influence operation kind of underway? Um, I, thi I suspect that there is an influence operation underway. I'm not sure that I would see it in Bond villain style being planned out step by step. Um, and I think a lot of it is a kind of let's go out and let's see. But, but one of the things that we see so strongly within China is that um, the, the dictator's best tool is self-censorship, essentially. You make people scared enough that they don't say things, they don't do things that might overstep the line. And in many senses, I think that is what is being exported. So the idea that you don't quite know if you might offend China, but it would be better not to invite this speaker because then maybe you wouldn't get these Chinese students and then maybe your university will be financially you know, in trouble, et cetera, et cetera. And I think self-censorship is, is, is definitely being exported. We have an excellent question, actually, from a, a, a someone watching online, Stephen Wu, who has asked um, about China's goals from an ideological perspective. And one of the things he's mentioned is minority groups. And I think, you know, clearly one of the issues that we can't ignore is uh, Xinjiang and uh, the, the accusations from many Western governments that what is happening there is essentially uh, something close to cultural genocide or certainly an attempt to uh, eradicate uh, what China would consider religious extremism. Um, is China in its presentation of Xinjiang at the United Nations or in its foreign policy or even students, you know, blocking Uyghur speakers in, in foreign campuses. Is that an example of China trying to export something pretty close to a kind of authoritarian model in terms of trying to, 
shape that conversation around Uyghurs and, and in its foreign policy with you know neighbors like Kazakhstan. Let's ask about Xinjiang. I, I, I think you can accuse China of um, uh, insensitivity and particularly insensitivity to um, public relations, which is very poor. We understand that, but um, I, I, I don't I don't see China uh, regarding that as as genocide, and nor, nor do I see um, th this. Uh, you might call it Han chauvinism, shading off into a cultural genocide. Now, um, we, we, we know that um, in terms of a civilizational state, which China is, uh, it's waxed and waned uh, with the growth and, and, and diminution of empire. And we know that there is no such thing uh, as uh, a Chinese ethnic person. It's not an ethnicity. It is a way of life. So we know that the, the border peoples for 2,500 years um, they have adopted a certain diet, um, and they have dressed in a certain way. When the empire waxed, so they wear silk, and they wear cotton if they can't afford it, they then reverted to a pastoral life when the empire waned. Therefore, we're seeing that uh, push and pull. But I, 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 I think to um, label this um, genocide, cultural genocide, uh, it, it's, it's actually... Okay, I, I, I don't want to get too hung up on, on, on labels. Though. It was me that raised it. Um, Brian Fong... You've written very eloquently about influence operations. On the question of Xinjiang, what should we take away from the fact that China has been so amazingly successful with things like the organization of, of Islamic states, where Muslim countries have been praising China's treatment of Muslims within its own borders, uh, to the astonishment of you know, Western governments? And yet China's arguments about Xinjiang are going down like a lead balloon in Western capitals. So why is China so incredibly good at influencing some countries, and so incredibly bad right now at getting its message across in the West. What's going on? I think China very has briefly. been very successful over the past few decades to strengthen the party machinery so that they can, uh, uh, through the, uh, uh, the party machinery, uh, to control the internet, the digital authoritarianism, all these things, to uh, exercise very tight control uh, over all the peripheries within China. But they face a uh, lot of problems in Hong Kong, because Hong Kong, after all, is an offshore jurisdiction where the party machinery cannot directly operate. So we can very interesting if we compare uh, uh, how Beijing handle and three different challenges in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, I think. So it's when they have control, they can be incredibly effective, yep. but they struggle where they don't have the same levers of control. Well, it's a subject that we could talk about uh, forever. It's a subject I write about every week, so <laughs> you'll forgive me. But we're right out of time, and we have some fascinating panels coming up. And in <laughs> fact, we have a wonderful poem uh, coming next. So I'd like to invite our panel to uh, move you. and make way for our colleague Tigan, who is going yeah. to read a poem for us, or recite a poem for us. Lottery. Perhaps this is what purgatory looks like. You surrender at the airport maybe by saying, I'm a refugee seeking asylum. You are told that in order to stay, you must first overstay. You are coerced to break a law in order to seek protection. The hard faces and unfeeling eyes without a common language or iota of empathy tell you to go back to where you came from, but you can't. There is nothing for you there but flames and drone strikes. You may have friends forcibly disappeared, bodies never found. You've seen the curve of your brother's body being shot in broad daylight, folding like a question mark, as if to ask if the world even cares about your story. You try to form the words to convey your truth, but people don't want to hear it, not here. It is more convenient to blame you for daring to exist. Your body is hyper-visible but dehumanized in the reading down of judgments or black letters of legislation written by men and women from the comfort of sleek air-conditioned rooms with a sea view who cannot see you and never envision you as a person. You have done nothing wrong and yet you are an all-too-convenient diversion from the real problems at hand. 
In this crowded, reclaimed landscape, the jagged buildings are like the uncountable bars of a jail cell. Your passport is confiscated by authorities, and you cannot move forward, only backward, handcuffed to the airplane seat. You've heard stories of the ones they send back, and pray each day it will not be you. Or, if you languish here, your children who are born to the Bohemia flag and know its languages and customs, calling no other place home, will never have legal status. You live without an income and rely on the kindness of strangers so that your descendants are educated for their own uncertain future. You hear the furious questions about why you chose to come here as if there is a choice between a death rattle and purgatory. The blackened streets ooze with inertia, a dominant population unaware of their privilege, to not be drafted at random in this generation to not have to put their lives in another person's hands. They have forgotten how grandfather and grandmother arrived here. The subdivided flats and subdivisions of identity mean they will never call themselves the sons and daughters of asylum seekers. But the blood in their veins is of the people who managed to steal away in the middle of the night, across borders, swimming oceans and traversing countries in the hope of witnessing another daybreak. They have more in common with you than they would ever admit. They have merely won a lottery of birth and no more. Thank you very much, Tegan. That was great. Um, and now I'd like to invite Joshua Wong and Sean Ryan onto the... Um, up here, please. Um, Joshua Wong, as I'm sure you all know, is Secretary General of Demosisto, and Sean Ryan is founder of the China Market Research Group based in Shanghai. Um, thank you very much for joining me. Okay. Now, rarely, I think, has, um, has a debate been more timely. Um, debating Hong Kong is our subject today, and we've got 25 minutes to sort out something that many of us have been debating for weeks, months, years, decades. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, ask each of our speakers to speak for three minutes each and then possibly very briefly perhaps respond to each other. And then I'd love you all to have a think about what you want to ask our panellists and, and anyone online as well would be great. Um, so Joshua, would you like to start? Okay. Uh, good evening again. It's my honor to share some of my point of view and insight of what's going on in Hong Kong. I strongly aware and realize how the real confidence crisis emerging in Hong Kong since yesterday after Hong Kong government announced to impose the new law by the emergency regulation ordinance, which just put Hong Kong people in a more difficult and complicated situation. As we are aware how banks calls happen in Hong Kong, how residents in different major districts, they just rush to the bank or ATM machine to take the cash out. Or even lots of the elderly, they just went to supermarket to have to stock food before this long weekend. This kind of incident or dynamics never happened before Hong Kong government formally announced and executed the emergency ordinance. Apart from how the confidence crisis never happened in the past few months under the clash of violence or protests, but happened since yesterday after the announcement of Carrie Lam. We also aware the working class discontent happened recently. Yesterday, three hours before the formal announcement from Carrie Lam. Lots of professionals and lots of working class, they march during the lunch time, during the lunch hour at Central or Taiku, the central business district of Hong Kong, and to against the impose and the execution of the emergency ordinance. In the past few years, when lawmakers were unseated, activists including me were jailed, and how a uh, book publisher being kidnapped to Hong Kong. Hong Kongers have less intention or incentive to talk to the street. 
But even during the normal weekday, we have Hong Kong people. Perhaps they may be accountants, they may be lawyer, and they suddenly strongly realize how Hong Kong is under such chaos generated by Beijing authorities. And it just results in the march suddenly happen in the central business district in the CBD. So after explaining about the working class discontent and the concrete confidence crisis of people, not towards the protester, but towards the government, I hope to emphasize on the fundamental way out or the solution. Hong Kong people have been asking for free election since three decades. In the previous day, perhaps business sector might have lost of hesitation. Just like five years ago during the umbrella movement, business leaders were the ones criticized on the umbrella movement. But in the past few months, we have experienced and realized how Hong Kong government and Beijing are not only generating chilling effect to protesters, but even targeted business sector. No matter the Cafe Pacific CEO need to resign or other uh, business sector uh, leaders face loss of uncertainty and interference from the pro-Beijing camp. We Thank just you. imply that we have to safeguard Hong Kong political and economic freedom. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. So first off, thank you so much to The Economist for inviting me here. I think it's great that we have the opportunity to have an open and safe debate where it's very important to hear different views. Um, safety is important. So I first want to challenge Joshua to condemn publicly violence that's been targeted at mainland Chinese as well as mainland businesses. Because I'll tell you, even me, and I generally am pro-Beijing, and I think that's well known, I sympathize with you during the umbrella protest. I sympathize with a lot of the protests over the last 100 days. But once I started to see the violence, like at the JP Morgan employee yesterday who said, we are Chinese, and then he got punched in the face. Once I start seeing attacks on mainlanders, that's when we start to lose support for you. And I'll tell you, I live in Shanghai, and many mainlanders have told me the exact same thing. So I challenge you to condemn that publicly after I'm done speaking. But second, what I want to do is talk a little bit about more concrete actions on how we can solve the problems in Hong Kong. Right now, we hear a lot about freedom, or evil, or the vote. What I want to do is look at if Joshua Wong is the next CEO of Hong Kong, or if he's the governor, or if there's universal suffrage, there's still the same underlying issues that are facing Hong Kong. So let's take a look at what those issues are and how we can solve them. It starts back from the 1980s. The 80s and 1990s, Hong Kongers were very scared of mainland China. They said mainland China would be anti-business, anti-capitalist, and would destroy the golden goose and destroy Hong Kong as a global finance center, as Joshua named it before. So what did Beijing do? They did two things that were smart at the time but have caused problems long term. The first is they named a CEO rather than a governor. The CEO position then basically, instead of addressing the grievances of low and middle income Hong Kongers, started focusing and catering to the business community. That was problem number one. The second problem is they wanted to get the tycoons, like Li Kaixing, the Quoks, the Lees, the Wu's on board. Because the idea then was if you could get Li Kaixing to support Beijing and support reunification, then the Hong Kongers would follow suit. So Beijing gave Li Kaixing Wang Fujing Street, the main street in Beijing to develop. Also did the same thing with Huai Hai Zhong Lu, with the Lees. What that has created is way too much wealth is concentrated in five families. It's, un, it's very difficult for regular Hong Kongers to have upward social economic mobility. And that's caused a lot of desperation. They're unable to buy houses. And there's a lot of frustration. So I only have 20 seconds. So solution-wise, what I think there needs to be done is there needs to be a reformation of the local government. There needs to be, Carrie Lam should resign, okay? And I, again, I'm pro-Beijing, but she's done a horrible job. Second, what they need to do um, is increase inheritance tax, and most importantly, stop the monopolies. You cannot have Li Kaixing and pay him when you go to the supermarket, electricity, housing, telecom, everything. And let me be clear, I don't think the tycoons okay. are bad people. They're good people, but Thank they're you. taking advantage of the system. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much to you both. Um, Joshua, a brief response, particularly okay. on the, the question of violence. Yeah. I love the remark on solution rights, especially we know the tension between protesters and mainlanders 
happened in the past few months. Yesterday is not the first incident and not the first accident that no one hoped to hope it to happen. I would say that instead of blame or condemn on any behavior or protester, I prefer to find out the solution and through the trial and error pro uh, process and to let us to realize that even protesters, they will have the incentive or intention to have self-defense or self-protection. But how to use force and also keep and maintain public support is matter for us. Especially uh, apart from the clash happened yesterday with the J staff of the JP Morgan, uh, I think everyone in this room uh, realized or remember what happening during the airport clash with the protester and the journalist or the spy come from mainland China. And after the clash happened and force had been used by protester with the trial and error and the deliberative democracy and the discussion on online forum with the trial and error principle, we also saw how protester the day after apologized in the airport for the clash or the violence happened. So I think how protester get the idea instead of criticize, blame, or condemn on anything. How to provide a concrete plan or solution is more important. And refer to the discussion and mention about the social upward mobility. Perhaps it might be part of the reason for young generation talk to the street to join the protest and rally. But just us, let us to remember how it changed compared to five years ago. Five years ago is the movement led by student leader or university student. But for the movement expand from 200,000 people to now two million, more than 2 million people. I just see how from the generation of baby boomers to millennials or Gen X, from youngster to elderly, and from the lower class to upper class elite, just see how lawyer, accountants, doctor, be even being arrested and prosecuted with the riot charges. It's just proof that how cross-generation in Thank Hong you. Kong engage in the movement. Thank yeah, you but you're going to lose support from mainlanders and everyday Hong Kongers. I've been going out and interviewing a lot of Hong Kong people over the last month, and about 70% of them said, you know what, I originally sympathized with the protesters. But once it became a protest movement into a riot movement, that's when a lot of people I shied away. Yeah. I think uh, we should stop discussing <laughs> that because we know that a lot of people are coming out on the streets. So we know that, sure, there are some people who oppose what is happening in different bits. Um, Sean, I wanted to ask you something. Um, beyond, um, let me express some, some questions about whether um, if you now had a change in the inheritance tax laws that you would really dissipate the, uh, the protest. But I'm interested in, um, in, in one of the things that you've noted, which is how much anger anger there is around right now. And this is, you know, for whatever reason, um, there is this, this um, rage about and, and disagreement about what it means to be Chinese and, and a, um, a dislike by some Hong Kongers of mainland Chinese. But what should Beijing do about that? I mean, that's a huge, it's one thing identifying that as a problem, but what should they do about it? That's a very fundamental question. Yeah, that's a great question. So the first, you know, some of the anger. So I went out and I interviewed a lot of protesters yesterday, and there was huge anger. No, I, and yeah. I, I'll get there. And, you know, one of the things that I found very interesting when I was talking to 18, 19 year olds is I said, how much of it is anger towards mainland Chinese? And what they said was, I'm embarrassed to be Chinese. I'm embarrassed if people are going to say that they're Chinese and, I'm, and we're Chinese because they're uncivilized. There's a lot of looking down upon them as country bumpkins. So what does Beijing need to do? They need to start to readdress l more benefits for low and middle class Hong Kongers. Now, what I would argue is that mainland China has actually been pretty good in their mind towards Hong Kong. And that's, they've given incredible benefits towards Hong Kong passport holders. You can live in, Hong, in China, not pay income tax there. You can buy houses. Um, when there's a lot of limits on the number of homes that mainland Chinese can buy in, say, a Shenzhen or in a Shanghai, somebody from Hong Kong can buy that. So they have done and enriched a lot of the Hong Kongers over the last 20 years. But what they've forgotten to do is get the low income and middle income okay. to be able to increase. So your, your argument is basically that um, people are protesting because they are not able to get rich enough. We'll come back to that in a minute. Joshua, I want to ask you, where is this heading? What's going to happen? Where is it heading? It's the question that should be answered by Carrie Lam <laughs> or the executive council. If, if she council. would have accepted our invitation, yeah, we would have had her Yeah, of course, we hope she could come to the summit. Um, 
It's hard for us to predict what will happen. Just like even one week ago, no one could imagine Hong Kong government will execute the emergency ordinance. But what we are aware is, is far more less. It's far more only focused on the lower or middle class uh, difficulties or the challenge that they face. Lots of foreign media journalists in the past three months or around early or around mid or late of June, they always ask that, oh, people talk to the street, it is only because they, are, they don't have enough uh, salary and they have lack of uh, good economic condition or etc. But and, uh, it's on, it is the movement that only led by students. But I always told them the fact that Hong Kong is the global city almost with the lowest birth rate. And when we have more than 25% of population talk to the street, I think it's far more than only about the upward mobility problem. For those uh, lawyers or doctors, they talk to the street and result in prosecuted by the riot charges. They really have a good quality or li of life and high social status or etc. And they have no worry or consideration on uh, can they really reach to the upward mobility upward social class because they are already in that social circle already. So I think now the fundamental confidential crisis that I mentioned, how could be solved by the government? I think it's more than upward mobility and also uh, refer to the question of sense of belongings. Um, 10 years ago, people is still celebrating how Beijing hold the Olympic Games. Um, five years ago, uh, people still realize that Hong Kong government ignore our demand on free election, but still have a bit confidence or hope on expecting President Xi Jinping to be the reformer. And even some of the pro-democratic camp politicians five years ago openly declared that he or she or they hope President Xi could reform China and Hong Kong. But in the past five years with the hardline policy, we just imply that people have no hope on Beijing and how people confidence and the satisfaction to both Hong Kong and China government rapidly reduced is also different with what happened in 2003 against the Article 23. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we've got tons of questions. I'd ask you to make your questions quick, please. We don't have much time and we shall endeavour. Who would like to ask a question? Yes, we have a yes here. Excellent. Hello, my Hello. Um, my question is more towards Joshua. Um, obviously, things have escalated, okay? And there's divide amongst people who have said, okay, now I've had enough, it's gotten out of hand. And I know that there are very peaceful people out there because if everyone was rioting, there would be no Hong Kong left, okay? So everyone isn't rioting. I think that the violence and the anger and the rioting is the language of the unheard. People are angry and they're not being heard. Now, there's five demands now. Obviously, you can't, everyone can't get everything, but if they're willing to have dialogue with the other side, what is the other side willing to negotiate to end this and everybody come out with something that they came in f looking for. So it has to end eventually. How will it end? And is that side, because I support. Thank you very much, that's great, yeah. thank yeah. you. So your question is how will it end? And I'm gonna have a second question as well from Haley Wong who is watching online, who says, why is Joshua mainly asking for intervention from the US? So yeah. Joshua, very quickly, why are you asking for intervention from the US? And secondly, if you're gonna negotiate, what, what can you negotiate, what's their room? Uh, Hong Kong is being recognized as the global city. When we and when almost 100,000 US citizens live in Hong Kong and lots of US companies set up their Asia headquarters in Hong Kong and Hong Kong is suffering in not only political but even humanitarian crisis. I think world leaders and also country around the world, they must have a say on how to safeguard Hong Kong unique status being recognized as the Asia financial center. And for the question about uh, how we would uh, turn out or what's the next step about the escalation of the protester. Um, of course, we don't expect every everyone in this room or even every protester will agree on all the behavior of protester, no matter they use petrol bomb or etc. But I think how the public opinion according to the survey conducted by university is just proof that more than 75% of Hong Kong citizens agree the demand 
of universal suffrage, and more than 80% of Hong Kong citizens urge government set up the Investigation Commission, the Independence Inquiry, on police brutality. So uh, we may have disagreement or different opinion on the strategy, tactics, or behaviors, but Hong Kongers have the majority consensus on the political demand. So asking for dialogue, Hong Kong government, um, I would say that Carrie Lam has set up dialogue, but a few days later, she just endorsed, agree, or approve how riot police use live round bullet shoot towards high school students. So I'm asking, on the one hand, you are asking for dialogue, and on the other hand, the, the regime or the authorities is holding the gun and use the live bullet to point towards people. Is this the solution? Thank you very much. Um, we've got time for one more quick question and a very brief response. Yes, there's a question here. Thank you. I have this question for John. The, um, how do you think of this statement? Democracy is the best system to deliver peace, cohesion, and consequently prosperity, and that is because rulers, those in power, are elected. So they are more responsive to the needs of the people. They could rule because they have the consent of the people, because they have the consent of the governed. So I think democracy is great. But I think more important than democracy is you have a government that's willing to address the needs and the grievances of the everyday people, one that has good checks and balances, and a government that has regular leadership transitions. So I'll look at China, and one of the reasons why I like what the government has done is in 1989, only 65% of Chinese females were literate versus about 85% of Chinese males. Now the number for Chinese born after 1989, it's 99.7% for males and 99.6% for females. In 1989, the average per capita GDP of India, uh, India and China both were about 300. China right now is 9,100 US dollars, while India is only 1,850. So China has done something right in the last 30 years. They are addressing the grievances and the needs of the everyday Chinese, which would be food, education, a way to move up economically. And there have been good leadership transitions since 1989, and there have been checks and balances. It hasn't been through a vote, through the wide population, but it has been through the elites. And there has been more balance of power under the Jiang Zemin, the Hu Jintao administrations than a lot of people give credit for. You know, again, you look, Boris Johnson was directly elected by 160,000 people. He wasn't elected by all, every single British person. Right, and there will be a chance for the British people to have their say, sure, <laughs> which is the great difference. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're out of time. Joshua Wong, Sean Ryan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to um, ask Dom Ziegler to come back to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Rosie. Um, and our next session Thanks, is going to good. follow on very seamlessly from, uh, from the last, and, and that's going to be about reimagining Hong Kong. Let's look towards the future. So if I could please invite uh, my fellow panelists uh, uh, aboard, Bonnie Leung, Anthony Dapperin, and Regina Yip. From the you just uh, however you like, but just go on to okay. the end, on, mm -hmm. the, on the left there. Hi. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Yes. Great. Great. Um, yes, so, so we're going to cast ahead and try and sort of imagine <laughs> some future scenarios uh, for Hong Kong. But I think it's helpful if we start by actually trying to put the current turmoil in some sort of historical uh, context. And that's why I'm going to turn to you, Anthony, as lawyer and author of uh, a very good book on protest in Hong Kong, because I think many people not familiar with the territory uh, will think of this as uh, a, a fairly, until recently, apolitical place. Mm. Um, at a place where, um, whilst there wasn't democracy, it's certainly not in the colonial times and not now, um, uh, that, that when protests uh, erupt, they, they achieve nothing. In fact, that's not the case, is mm. that right, Anthony? Could you just sketch for us a little bit the, the, uh, the, the, the way that this is not something new, and mm. then we will also talk about the ways in which this is new? Absolutely. I mean, this is very clearly a continuation of a, a long history, a sort of a, a, the end of a continuing narrative arc of, of political protest in Hong Kong. 
um, in particular in, in the post-handover years, though of course it has a long history going back um, way before that. I think uh, Joshua has already uh, you know, quite eloquently spoken of how the current protest movement has been a, an outgrowth, a development of the umbrella movement of five years ago, uh, but we can even go back to a, 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 a very similar parallel back in, in 2003, the, the Article 23 uh, anti-subversion law controversy. Well, Regina knows a lot about that. Regina will know well, which is a very similar situation. The government proposed to introduce the law. Uh, the people came out into the streets en masse uh, to protest against it, and they were successful, and the government ultimately withdrew that law. So a very similar thing to what we saw happen here. Um, we saw a, a similar successful protest campaign when, when Joshua again led the campaign against the national education curriculum, a proposal by the government to introduce a compulsory patriotic education campaign to Hong Kong schools, which again was withdrawn. Um, the umbrella movement wasn't successful in the sense that it didn't achieve its aims, but it certainly um, was a, a, a significant political awakening for Hong Kong's younger generation, produced future leaders such as Joshua, and, and enabled them to develop their, their strategies and their tactics for protest, which we are seeing now on the streets over the past few months. So it's really a continuation but of that. Go back further. Case. At the mm. last time that, um, that the, f the, the major power from the north threatened to invade Hong Kong was 1967, mm. Mm. when actually the Communist Party of China um, instigated riots here in the territory. And just to put some things in context, that period, it was nearly a year, mm. uh, was significantly more violent than, 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 uh, than so far. Mm. Yeah. 51 deaths, hundreds of bombs mm. uh, planted um, by you need to leftists. ask me, I was there. Please, well, I would like, I, I would <laughs> tell me I about it. And tell me, tell I me have how Hong Kong has been. I have lived through Kong more riots than Joshua knows. <laughs> <laughs> and use of emergency regulations. Well, now, some of the bombers who went to prison under, under uh, uh, colonial times um, have ended up with the Golden Order of the <laughs> Bauhinia. So I just uh, w wonder whether Joshua might draw the same conclusion that, in fact, if he protests now, he will, <laughs> uh, in some future regime, be honoured for it. Mm. I doubt that very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bonnie, could I ask you, as uh, one of the organisers of the mass uh, protests, um, numbers are uh, accurate numbers are hard to come by, but let's just say two million for the biggest for the biggest march. Right. Um, many people I've spoken to uh, taking part in protests um, have said that they don't actually expect change. The topic of Anthony's book is that actually change does come about, including after the, uh, the, the leftist riots in 1967. Mm -hmm. There were major social changes to education, improved education, housing, working conditions, and so forth. Um, the protests uh, when you were Secretary for Security um, actually caused the shelving of the anti-sedition um, bill. So is it the case that that protest and violence, even violence, and we'll talk about violence separately in a minute because I think we need to grapple with this, with, with this issue about the legitimacy of it, but is it the case that it can actually change things? Because if we think that it can, well then we can uh, start to imagine a slightly more hopeful future. Well, I very much hope so because if two million people, almost a quarter of Hong Kong population uh, took to the streets, uh, angrily chanting slogans to the Hong Kong government and still doesn't make a change. Uh, who else would love to live in such a city? And especially why we see so many clashes happening here in Hong Kong is because Hong Kong people do not see hope. We see um, uh, on, an, uh, on the 9th of June, uh, that is our first million people march, uh, we had only two uh, demands. That was uh, withdraw the extradition bill and Carrie Lam to step down. If at that time, after one million people took to the streets, after we announced the number, if the government immediately uh, respond to people's voices and withdraw the bill, we'll probably very happily go home and sleep. And then afterwards, they decided to carry on as scheduled. So a few days later, uh, people took to the streets again, circulated the Legislative Council, and forced a number of people risk their life, risk their future, risk 10 years of imprisonment to physically stop the pro-government, uh, pro uh, pro pro-Beijing legislators from entering uh, the Legislative Council to stop them voting, to stop them starting of the, de the debate of the uh, extradition bill. And so, the clashes 
that we see here in Hong Kong are forced by the Hong Kong uh, SAL government's tyranny. And the clashes that we see now uh, in the streets are actually reactions to the government uh, totally unaccountable to Hong Kong people. Regina, I'm going to give you a full chance to, uh, yes, to respond yes. to that in a second, but I just want us to focus on violence, first of all. Um, one uh, former legislator said that, uh, who, was, who was a colleague of yours, um, told me uh, after the end of the march on Tuesday, the peaceful rally that it ended in Central, it was illegal, but it was peaceful, um, that he hoped that some of the more radical, more violent protesters uh, would restrain themselves because now was the time to find political discourse and dialogue, particularly with the district council mm. elections coming up. But one thing he did point out is that actually the violence worked. That's to say, if protesters had not invaded LegCo, then the anti-extradition bill would not have uh, been shelved and then withdrawn. So I just would like to ask the audience now um, about this. I, uh, like many of my colleagues, are concerned about the violence and about where this might lead. And I, as a Brit, a half-Irish Brit, um, am concerned about the parallels with Northern Ireland because it was in the late 1960s yeah. that a very large section of society in Northern Ireland felt that it was deprived of civil and political rights, the Catholics. The protests were at first peaceful. They were answered with tear gas. Uh, that forged a unity uh, among the Catholics and violence escalated. Mm. 3,000 or so um, people died during the so-called Troubles. Um, certainly, uh, my growing up was very much coloured by that. Um, with bombs I on the, the I mainland Britain as well as, of course, in Ireland, and violence political uh, against politicians uh, as uh, as well as as well as ordinary people. Could you've all got these paddles, these yes and no paddles? Um, who th thinks that the risk is quite high of the violence escalating to, for instance, the <coughs> violence that Hong Kong saw in 1967, something like 2,000 people injured? Uh, 51, correct me if I've got the figure, 51 deaths. Um, who is concerned that, that, that there could in Hong Kong be a prolonged period of that kind of uh, violence? Please raise your hands to s or your paddles. Um, mm. And, s well, the yes, the, the concerns um, outnumber the, the unconcerns um, by a fair, uh, a fair proportion. Mm. Um, Regina, could I ask you please to yes. uh, tell me your your uh, views and thoughts on, uh, for yes, violence, which I think many people in the room would argue has taken place on both sides, and, and, and this would then be the occasion to, uh, for all of us to sort of find ways find ways forward, how, do how to come back from the brink and how to, well how to find a meeting. Well, point. I agree with um, Dominic. Anthony. Uh, yes. Sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, Anthony, that uh, this is a continuation of uh, Occupy Central. You know. But Occupy Central was uh, relatively peaceful uh, under the guise of civil disobedience. You know. But um, on day one, six, um, 9th of June, the peaceful demonstration of large numbers of protesters quickly degenerated into road blockages and attacks on LegCo. You know, and then it's a continuation of violence and escalation of violence. I have actually been talking to experts you know, who have dealt from Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. I, they've been sharing the Northern Ireland experience with, with me. And what's happening is what started in 2014 as civil disobedience you know, is now turning into uh, riots, terrorism, even insurrection. Because uh, look at what the latest demands, you know. Do, uh, it's n not really about the extradition bill or the five demands. People are calling for disbandment of the police, disbandment of government, um, uh, taking over Hong Kong, you're handing over back to the US. You know, I really reject Joshua's argument that uh, we are a global center so we could uh, ask the US could, could to help. So is New York, so is London. Does it mean that those governments should account to other shareholders and stakeholders in their city? That's not a valid argument. Now there are lots of calls for dissolution of our government. Uh, proclaiming Ma On Shan to be independent is very dangerous. There are all sorts of demands, really? Regina, but there have been 
there's been surprising consistency about these five demands. Uh, universal suffrage doesn't seem too bad to me. What's wrong with that? I'm a constitutionalist. To get universal suffrage, being a part of China, we must proceed in accordance with our constitution. In fact, I debated that with a senator last week about why, uh, why is Beijing not giving us universal suffrage now? Well, the, the basic law says very clearly that is the ultimate aim. In accordance with two principles, orderly and gradual po progress and in the light of actual situation of the day. Frankly, as you know, we have district councils, elections coming up very soon. I'm supposed to help my candidates. But did you know that full details of my home address and those of 43 pro-government legislators have been uploaded on LIHKG? I fear for myself. I don't want corrosive access to be thrown at me or fireballs. I've been speaking up against violence. You know, is, uh, Do we have the right conditions for universal suffrage right now? Well, I would say that uh, China has made four appalling choices of chief executive so far. I don't so dispute that, could frankly. Uh, <laughs> this could hardly be worse. Better choices could have been made, you know. <laughs> um, on this subject, I mean, I, 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 we as journalists um, spend a lot of time trying to understand what, how, what China understands of Hong Kong. And when we meet Chinese officials, um, they are excruciatingly wooden in their sloganeering. Yeah. Um, and, of course, currently they they um, accuse black hands of being behind all this strong it feeling here. There's that a American big American cultural American. difference well, between cultural the difference, way they I mean operate and we it's operate. It's a cultural difference, know. but I mean, it's actually, it's, it, it's a factual claim, which is really quite a strong one. Mm. And um, I, I just wonder, I mean, do you and your colleagues tell them they're wrong? That's one question. The second question is, even if we assume that the liaison office and the Foreign Affairs Commission here in Hong Kong sort of have an idea of what's going on, although I'm not sure because the deputy what? commissioner, he, he told me the other day that he absolutely didn't know anybody who had taken part in your marches, Bonnie, or who had any family members who had taken part. <laughs> so that's rather a lot of Hong Kong people he's refusing <laughs> to speak to. But, uh, but anyway, but I mean they it would be I worrying if they don't understand Hong Kong. I it would also be worrying if they didn't pass up their understanding to Xi Jinping and his people. Are they worried about passing up? It's not easy for them to really find out what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, they have a youth department, but um, would Bonnie talk to the youth department officials freely? Well, I didn't have their would phone Would you call. have qualms? You <laughs> know? Phone, Some of my, my colleagues have, calmed, have, have qualms me. about going to the liaison well, office. But but it, it's hard for them to contact other young, young it's, people it's all done through the other than all the, done through the wealthy ones and the privileged ones. You know? it, it's, it's very all difficult. Done through these organizations. Mm. And I mean, w when, when Carrie Lam herself a few weeks ago said, yes, it's important to speak to the youth, she went and addressed the PLA youth camp and spoke to yeah, the Mandarin. The, the Hong Kong government has the same problem. Their mode of outreach is to hold a youth summit once yes. a year in the government secretariat. Well, well this is yeah. our youth summit mm. as well. <laughs> <laughs> We're speaking for some of us in the room. Aren't we? Yeah. Mm. So now, how to bring things back from the brink? Regina, you yeah, first, please. I think uh, I lived through many riots. I lived through two occasions when the emergency regulations were invoked. The uh, first time in 1967 when I was do taking my equivalent of GCE O-level, you know. And then in 1973 when there was an oil price crisis, the government introduced emergency um, control of fuel price, you know, regulations, you know. In the U.S., people invoke emergency regulations far more often than we do when they have hill fires, when they have a hurricane. Recently, yeah, I noticed Los Angeles elected officials are asking the governor to, to declare emergency because of homelessness. Well, I'm not dodging the question, but I think what I think is, just as in the 1970s, after the riots, there were reforms. McLehose, I have a lot of respect for him. I work under him. He introduced radical reform. He started a 10-year housing program. Uh, we only had compulsory education for nine years in 1979. Again, Meckler pushed that. Mm -hmm. And the network of cultural centers, music officers all over Hong Kong, because the Brits, my bosses, found out the depth of the anger. You know, 1966 Kowloon disturbances in four days, 1,465 people uh, arrested, you know, and um, several killed, many life rounds fired, deployment of police and military, 
you know. That's why our police in such a difficult position, because they are all we have right now. Whether in 66 and 67, we have po joint police military operations plus auxiliary defense units. There may be one difference, which is in 67, yeah. the police had the support of of ordinary Hong Kongers, many of whom had yes, fled communist yes, China. Yes, that's right. T today, yes. the police has lost the support of a very large proportion of... Also... Of, uh, that's part of the problem. And, I, yeah, they have and, and some of your colleagues at Odexco also yes. do acknowledge that yes. this, this is an issue that has to be dealt with, that police get off scot-free, as do triad The relationship when they have has been broken. Power. I do yeah. agree. And that started in 2014. You know, it's hard to repair that sort of well, relationship. We'll spend m much of the, the rest of the session, which mm. is not long, uh, on, on repairing. Mm. Anthony, briefly, if you could tell me what you think needs to happen, then, and, and then I'll ask Bonnie. Yeah, well, two, two points, and that follows directly on from Regina's point. After the 1966 riots, one of the first things the government did was to hold an independent inquiry into what had happened, uh, the causes of the riots, and some of the solutions. And I think there's been many calls for an independent inquiry. I don't think we need to go through all the arguments, except to say that I think it's absolutely necessary um, to investigate what's happened here. Um, frankly, I think if there was an independent inquiry after the Umbrella Movement, after what it was that brought the city to a standstill for, for 79 days back then, we might have discovered many of the problems and had ways to address them. Just very briefly, do you think there will be an, uh, an independent There inquiry? were two studies after the 1966 uh, riots, you know. But this time... Uh, there there was a sh much shorter study after the 1967 riots because the British government thought it was a cultural revolution inspired. So they submitted a report to FCO. But after the, the current events are, are over, you know, I, I do think there should be an in-depth study. How confident are you there will be one? I think I'm pretty confident. I In government, we talk right. about yeah. post-mortem. Yeah. You only conduct yeah. post-mortem the, after the event. After the death. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> after the death of the riots. <laughs> <you know? laughs> the other important point, I, th I think, is this fundamental breakdown of trust. And what, what really concerns me about what's been happening here is we've had a government that's disappeared. We, we've had basically no government for the last three months in Hong Kong, the governance by the police true. only. And, and a, a systematic breakdown in the institutional trust, that, that people um, not only no longer trust the government and the police, they are losing trust in the MTR, in Cathay Pacific, um, in all these institutions that, that people relied upon and, and, and trusted. And, and that is really a, a fundamental threat, I think, to, to the long-term peace and prosperity of Hong Kong. Uh, first of all, five demand, not one less, is chanted <laughs> by two million people. I have no authority to say otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, it is not because Hong Kong people are uh, unwilling to compromise. It's not because we're greedy, but because the ultimate goal to universal suffrage is already promised to Hong Kong people in the basic law. So uh, it is our ultimate goal, and we will soldier on until we seal it. But if we're talking about how to release tension, I would say, agree with Anthony, uh, the independent investigation, because now we are seeing that the Hong Kong police force uh, uh, exercising the brutality. We are seeing that uh, some police officers, the bad cops, blatantly breaking the law, caught on camera, and they're not facing any legal consequences, not facing fair trial. Shades of Northern Ireland again. Mm. And we cannot leave that there because when somehow we leave the campaign and we go home, the absolute power will corrupt, continue to corrupt absolutely, so we cannot leave it there. So. A olive branch, please, Regina Ip, tell Carrie Lam in to give us independent in investigation. The, uh, amongst the audience, who, who believes there should be, quite urgently, the promise of an independent inquiry? Uh, and those, no, the overwhelmingly yes. Could you pass that on to the Chief Executive? <laughs> I'm already fully aware Thank of that. <laughs> uh, I think there uh, should be a, a root and branch in inquiry after things have quietened down, not now. And uh, I, 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 you know, actually, after Occupy Central, seven policemen were charged and jailed. We are oh. looking forward mm. to the same happening. But you have to wait for due process. Year. You cannot just make accusations, you know. Well, you have to I did not. I expect fair trial, but now we see that armed mobs hitting people caught on camera. We know their identity, and there, there, still there are also videos of policemen police being, being attacked. Well, so you know, we have a, we have a question bombs. from uh, one of our viewers online, um, which is about uh, Hong Kong's uh, tycoons, who do seem to have a line into the chief executive's office. Mm. Um, would universal suffrage further empower Hong Kong oligarchs? 
who would like to uh, answer uh, that? Yeah, I'm happy to take it. Mean, this is what's always amused me about Beijing's resistance to universal suffrage in Hong Kong, because if they've learned anything from observing Western electoral politics, they'd know that it's always the rich and powerful and wealthy that, that end up calling the shots in, in, in open democratic elections just by virtue of the resources that they can wield. So you would think that if Hong Kong did have an open, fully, fully open universal suffrage system, the tycoons would still call the shots and you'd have the same result as we have at the moment. So I do wonder what Beijing's afraid of. Uh, but I think the, the silver lining is from the, the events, uh, the current events, I think Beijing has learned that tycoons are not the best allies. You know, <laughs> they, and they that Hong Kong needs re redistribution. We do the need redistribution. Does, Hong, does the Hong Kong government have the political strength to really take on the tycoons? For instance, to introduce a Singapore-style housing system, for instance. We, when New World gives a bit of farmland up, uh, farmland, which it may not even it have It's not before. easy, because like Singapore spot. started with a clean slate, you know. The government doesn't have and land and bank. The, the, the developers have families. the land bank. They have the land bank. The four big families, they have the land bank. We don't, you know. Well, architects say that there are brown field sites that um, could easily be used to quickly build cheap public housing. And the trouble is, of course, the tycoons also... Uh, keep the cost no. of construction. Actually, well several well. families are already offering lands. But that just sounds like a sort of, mm. you know, charity kind but of thing. But it's not just um, 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 resumption of land. You also need to work out a transport system. If you live in new territories, you know the East Rail, West Rail, all if saturated. If there's one thing the government mm. ought to be able to do, it's I'm sure it's transport. Mm. Mm. Questions, please, from the floor here. You, sir. And, and you next. Let's say that Carrie Lam resigns. Uh, what's next? And most importantly, who's next? Hmm. Carrie has said that she's not allowed to resign. And uh, whoever's next will inherit a big mess. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would very love if Carrie Lam uh, resigned and then we'll have free universal suffrage to elect our chief executive. I always think that Regina Eyre. Uh, is the is the victim of not having universal suffrage because <laughs> she herself <laughs> she herself uh, tried to elect last time, but she wasn't even nominated. Well I believe if we have universal suffrage, yes. you have very good chance. Well, that's what I told the U.S. senator I met last Saturday. Did they, <laughs> you know? did, they did they doubt your loyalty? What was it? No, no, no. You please. So this evening, we've really heard from a wide range of opinions, both for what's going on and against, for violence, against violence. But I think something everyone in this room can agree on, and even you guys on the panel, is that we all love Hong Kong. We wouldn't be fighting for Hong Kong from one end or the other end if we didn't love it. And that's something I think we can really find unity on. So in that spirit of loving Hong Kong, loving the city, from the food to the culture, just every, every person in Hong Kong, where do you hope Hong Kong is in maybe one year or in two years? Let's, uh, maybe all of you please answer it, starting with Bonnie. Well, uh, as I said, Hong Kong people are only reacting to the police brutality, reacting to the government uh, in uh, totally being irresponsive to Hong Kong people. So this question really should be uh, answered by Regina here, uh, who is also a member of the chief executive. Please, please, please do not make any more bad strategy, not any more big moves, because ever since mid-June, all the moves that the government had uh, given to Hong Kong people actually make things worse. Actually, we would have been uh, go home happily and sleep in mid-June if uh, the government had withdrawn the bill. Thank you, Bonnie. Here's just some sleep because there's a lot of very tired mm -hmm. uh, people with these protests. Um, Anthony. Yeah, I, I mean, I, obviously I would hope that, that, that things calm down and we have a restoration of, of, of peace and, and order in Hong Kong. But I think most importantly that the government give the people what they're asking for, which I think, uh, as Regina quite well pointed out, is nothing more than what the basic law is, is offering them. Um, and I, and I, I hope that we, we get there. Thank you. And Regina, a year's... Well, the 2014 package is still on the table. Mm. It was rejected by the Democrats, you know. And I hope next year there will be a new start. You know, I must be careful what I say, you know. I must be careful what I wish for, you know, frankly. <laughs> there could be a new administration. With a new administration, there could be a new start, new policies to redistribute, to deal with the land problems, to give the young people greater upward mobility, to mend the relationship between the police and the community, and even more importantly, between Hong Kong and our country. You know. Well, thank you very much indeed. I mean, I, I th that is a, you know, a mildly hopeful point on which to end uh, the discussions after this 
event um, you know, might, might uh, bring out less hopeful scenarios from some of you. But for now, could I please ask you to join me in a big round of applause for, for Bonnie, Anthony and Regina. Um, and I'm extremely glad that you all came together. And I think more of this dialogue sure between that. government and, uh, and others is really essential and it's something yes. that possibly Hong Kong has been missing. Yes. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we've been incredibly lucky to have the Peel Street Poets uh, Collective uh, this evening. Um, it's, been a, it's been a real treat and it's been a change of rhythm. And um, they, they've been going for 10 years. Is that, is that right, Akin? Uh, or 14. 14. Um, and they run workshops for the spoken word. So if any of you are interested in that, well, please be in, in touch with them. So Akin JJ, the last of our Peel Street Poets, you're very welcome. Now, this poem I wrote for a word, world in turmoil, but I was also reminded that it's always darkest before the dawn. So I give you Darkest Day Global. One, the span between the cold void of night and morning's first glimmer, volcanic glass dark, with a streak of shimmer, is longest on Earth's darkest day. Two, the span between hope and change to make this deeply riven nation inflate again is deepest between shining crests and lightless troughs as it twists and contorts through showers and gusts. Three, the distance between what enlightens us and the specters that frighten us has created a delirium of spasms, chasms so fathomless, even adamantine determination to bridge and to bridge these lividly trembling schisms bends and frays. Four, the breath between a black child's first breath and last breath is often, like December 21st, the shortest of days. It is no accident that darkness falls sharply, suddenly, like that day. Five, this land of ours has yet to see its darkest day. May the powers that are relinquish their desires to us so that we, the people, may seek a better way. Six, I told my toddler son in the night just before the dawn, baby, I'll be damned if you'll stay in the shadows. Awake, my sweet little boy. Stretch out, stand upright. Together, we will stride forth through the deep blank chill into the brilliance of the light. Thank you very much indeed, Akin, and thank you to all the Peel Street poets. I'd like to invite, please, my fellow moderators up onto the stage for our final session, part of which will be a sort of uh, ask the economist, possibly lecture the economist, on points that you would like to, to make uh, from what you've heard and thought about during this evening's event. Um, and then we're also going to, I think, make a few... Uh, you know, s uh, summing up um, points as things go on. And I think we, since we don't have enough chairs, we're all going to stand. <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> um, we've been practicing this song for some time, but we're still <laughs> slightly out of tune. But anyway, <laughs> um, or so just, uh, if I could please ask, are there things that you would like to raise? And this would have to be brief. 
um, or questions that you would like to ask us um, about this event, or indeed, indeed about how we, we try to go about making sense of the world, this part of the world. Uh, is, is there anything that is it you're burning to get off your chest? Oh, well, well, there's a micro microphone. We'll come to you now. Yes, thank you. I was wondering if you have any ch Chinese um, journalists as being part of your team who are covering China as well, it seems, from the look um, of... Well, yeah, David better b b uh, explain that, I think. So we would love, I think, uh, dearly love to have Chinese journalists writing for us. Uh, but unfortunately, Chinese law, uh, it's illegal. So we have some fantastic Chinese colleagues, um, but they cannot write for us because they would be in tremendous trouble and we could do nothing for them. Uh, we do have, uh, up in Beijing, recently arrived, a, a Chinese-Canadian journalist uh, who is a fantastic journalist. But I'm uncomfortable about the idea of praising him for being of Chinese ethnicity. He happens to be a fantastic journalist. To me, that's the important thing. But I think there is a real issue. It would be fantastic if all of us could employ Chinese nationals in China. But that's the Chinese government that makes that illegal. And, and Victor in Manchester made a point uh, earlier on that it was th the local journalists who were the brave ones. And um, that's certainly the case in China and other authoritarian countries uh, in Asia, in that you know, it's, it's <coughs> local researchers um, and the like who are most vulnerable. So we have a very precious resource in the form of our Chinese uh, colleagues. Um, I would say they, they, uh, they, they have faced greater risks than we do. Anthony. Um, uh, writing for an international publication like The Economist, all of you obviously have to have a mind to what's happening here, or the, the, the international relevance of what's happening here. Obviously, it's all very urgent and important to us because we're, we're living it. W what do you see as the things that are relevant and, and, and interesting and important to international readers about what's happening here in Hong Kong? Well, well Hong Kong's economic ties to the, to the world just go back so far. Um, and um, it's 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 a real uh, f for us. It, it's something that we we try to push the British government over. Um, you know, some of these ties have very quickly been forgotten, particularly in the sort of in the, in, the, in the Brexit you know in in the Brexit mess. But Hong Kong, I'm trying to. I mean, I I asked you about history. I'm trying to sort of make sense of Hong Kong in a broader context of uh, a greater China. Um, I was struck on Tuesday, late on Tuesday night, by s some of the slogans that were put up on the bus stops here in Hong Kong, which was free or support Tibet, Uyghurs, and Hong Kong. And now I don't know how long or how many of these slogans have appeared uh, before. By the way, the Hong Kong government is incredibly efficient at rubbing off <laughs> slogans, because <laughs> by the next morning it was all <laughs> gone. Um, but it's, it's some also something that... Um, we've touched on it throughout this evening, it's uh, sort of I identity and top-down identity. In the case of China, the Communist Party uh, inherited n not a ready-made state 70 years ago or nation. It, it inherited a China or aspired to a China whose borders um, were most extensive during the Qing dynasty. And it, 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 it inherited a country that was multi-ethnic. And it seems to me that particularly under Xi Jinping, um, that this, this attempt at uniformity is um, showing itself uh, in terms of China's uh, treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and also in terms of the slow throttling here in Hong Kong. It's in many ways the same story, which is also kind of surprising and, and kind of amazing when you think that, in fact, Hong Kong's birth as a, as a free trade enclave um, was something that was that something that mirrored the way that central the Central Asian Kokand state dealt with with China in the far west. Um, in both instances, China let foreigners set up enclaves to trade, um, and in a way, that was part of an approach to um, accommodating a multi-ethnic, vast multi-ethnic state, and um, and and now. This, you know, homogeneity, this uniformity, I think, is increasingly becoming a weakness for uh, for, for for China. But uh, here in Hong Kong, it's the anvil on which Hong Kong's new identity is 
is being forged. Just and to flip the question slightly, Anthony, um, I also th I, I think s on occasion um, you know, there, are, there are topics that we cover that um, there is particular interest, especially from our our, uh, our mothership in London. You know what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, you know what's happening on the ground. But sometimes our job is actually to say, um, you know, this this particular issue is happening on the ground. It's not getting traction over where you are and. Uh, immediately spring to mind, um, you know, the Rohingya crisis in, in Myanmar. So s sometimes the job is the other way. Tim. Hi there. Um, a lot of the activism we're seeing in parts of the world is being led by the young, which I think is very good. Hong Kong, uh, things around climate change. But when it comes to voting, the young are often the ones that don't turn out and vote, uh, where they have the vote. Do you see that as a big problem? What do we need to do to try and encourage young to actually perhaps get out and vote or get involved in politics perhaps more than uh, they are doing currently? Rosie, you want to? Um, okay. My, my um, perhaps over-optimistic belief is that that will change and that what we're seeing all around us now is a sign that that will change. So I suspect that um, the day that we get universal suffrage in Hong Kong, there will be a lot of young voters. Um, and I suspect, I hope, that at the next um, election in many countries around the world where, where, where societies are very divided, and I include Britain and America in that, that we would see more young voters than we have in the past. So um, if, if what we have at the moment is kind of um, these strange, strange uh, governments that, that are partly a reflection of the young not voting, um, I hope that that will change. I think we'll get them in the next referendum in Britain too. <laughs> And uh, presumably, you know, the, the, the if, if the voting age is, is lowered, then young people may feel that they have more say. Um, but th our polls, that th one of which I read out at the, s at the start of the, the, the event, show that a lot of uh, young people, not just here, feel the system is rigged against them, so particularly in Ed. Can I ask you all what you thought of the evening? What, what, uh, what aspects struck you, including listening to uh, to Manchester. I mean, the, the your panel, Lena, sort of brought some extraordinarily disparate activists. Yeah, together. I guess it, it what stood out to me was the way that um, political protest takes very different forms in different types of societies, and the efficacy really depends on what sort of country you're operating in. So the um, country that I spend a lot of time thinking about, South Korea, um, had a big political protest movement that started about three years ago um, that was entirely peaceful. Millions of people came out in the street and protested against the government that they felt was unaccountable, out of touch, only serving its own interests, which probably sounds familiar to, to some people in this room. And they managed to get the government out. The president was forced to vacate the Blue House. There was a plan, allegedly, um, to to bring in the army to disperse the protest, but that didn't happen because South Korea, which started out as a military dictatorship, is a, a functioning democracy now and a fairly mature one at that. So I guess the effects that a protest can have are very much dependent on the environment in which it takes place. I think f as an economist journalist, you know, we're very comfortable with kind of the what questions of politics. You know, what should a government do about the tax rate? You know, that's very uncomfortable economist territory. I think tonight was a very stark reminder that we live in an age of who politics. Who is my friend? Who is legitimate? Who is my government accountable to if it's not me? And so there's all kinds of clever policy suggestions about housing you could do in Hong Kong. But I think what we're seeing here is a crisis of who. No, it's who is good yep. and who is bad. Who is a Hong Konger? Who is Chinese? And as you say, you know, can you allow a dual identity? And China's clumsiness in being very reluctant to allow that dual identity. Sudhir's uh, contribution was fantastic for exactly that, the, the, the good and bad ways in which we can play the politics of who. But I think what Sudhir also points out is if you get that wrong, nothing else can happen. And it feels to me that that maybe is blocked here. The who of politics yeah. is blocked here. Well, we've come to the end of the evening. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for taking part. It's been fantastic to have you here as uh, speakers and as audience really engaged, and we've hugely enjoyed it. So thank you. I'd like to thank my fellow moderators. Um, and could I also please um, ask all of us to um, 
have a round for those who organise this evening, Laurel and Helena and her team, um, who I think have done a fantastic job. <laughs> so here's to them. Um, we now ascend to, I think, the 21st floor, where there will be refreshments. So please do, the 23rd floor, so please do join us uh, up there um, for, for drinks and, and snacks and uh, for carrying on the conversation. Thank you again. <laughs>